Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started with our meeting. Okay. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you. It's a pretty beautiful day in Vermont. It seems like we have moved from spring to summer right away. It's nice to see some of you online and some of you in person. Can everybody hear me okay? I know that I'm not always the most loud speaker in the room, but I'll try to project my voice as best as I can. It is the first time we were with the community when we were at the Finance Committee. We, we wanted to make sure, again, to thank the community for the trust and support in passing the budget. And we're looking forward to continuing the work to make our district sustainable and, uh, and continue to emphasize what is best for kids, also at a cost that our taxpayers can afford. With that, we have a long agenda tonight, so I'm going to move right into our agenda. So. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda? No. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move right into the reception of guests. Do we have any public comments tonight, whether online or in person? Uh, that doesn't include our students because you guys have a special place in our agenda. So, any public comments? Oh, we have two online. Uh, Riley, do you want to unmute yourself? Riley, are you there? Okay, I'm going to move. Hold on one minute. Okay, so I'm going to wait a minute. I'm going to let uh, Lisa go next. Lisa Hanna, do you want to mute yourself, introduce yourself? Uh, Lisa Hanna Worcester. Um, thank you all for the work you're doing around configuration. I'd like to follow up on the letter that I shared with you all in the community this week. We all know that closing small community schools is a decision that carries significant weight and rightly so. There's specific information that our communities need, certainly before we are asked to vote on the future of our town schools, but also before we are asked to weigh in in forums. Number one, please provide us with clear information on the implications closing schools would have on our tax rates. The communication has been mixed regarding whether or not closing schools will save taxpayers money. Many in our community validly assume that they will see tax relief if we close our smallest schools. We need crystal clear information as to whether this is true. Please provide us with modeling and projections as to what the tax implications could be per $100,000 home value so that the financial implications are transparent. Number two, please provide us with specific examples of potential increased opportunities that our students would benefit from if our elementary schools were consolidated. We all know that there will be losses incurred by students if they are bust out of their communities for their elementary school experience. In order to fully engage in this conversation, we must be able to weigh specific potential gains against the losses. Uh, so my ask is that before the June board meeting and or our community is asked to engage, I ask that these key questions are answered. The decision to close any school is monumental. If the community and students do not see the expected benefits of such a decision and schools close, we will undoubtedly see more community members disenfranchised and frustrated with both school governance and educational spending moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I, I see Tani. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just navigating. Um, I um, thank you to all, all the board members and leadership team for investment of time, energy, and love into our schools and communities. I know this has been a really tough year. I appreciate your work to develop and pass a budget. Hire a new superintendent, a new 32 principal, complete a strategic planning process, and so much more to keep our schools running and our eyes focused on our vision. I'm really grateful for your labor and the chance to speak to you tonight. I'm a Worcester resident, former school, former school board member, Dodi alum, graduate of U32, and a parent of two kids, um, gone through Dodi. And as you consider the future of our schools and the models that would close Dodi and Callis, a robust community conversation is needed. And in order for my community to participate, we really need information. Um, I understand that the community is very concerned about increasing tax rates. Many people assume the simplest rate to lowering taxes is closing the schools, but we need to know how significant savings would actually be, how confident we are that per pupil spending would actually decrease by a significant margin. 
one of the main arguments in favor of merging districts was to streamline services and reduce costs, but data shows that per pupil spending is higher in merged districts than in single town districts. What does the data from other communities show about per pupil spending after closing elementary schools? How significant are savings and tax impacts? Um, when it comes to educational opportunities, what exactly does the board expect these to be? Uh, when I was on the Doty School Board and serving as a member of the School Quality Committee, we studied student outcomes data that showed that Doty students performed well compared with their peers in other schools, especially kids receiving free and reduced lunch and those on IEPs. We had guesses about why this was true, but we didn't know for sure why our most vulnerable kids were showing stronger learning outcomes than vul vulnerable kids in some neighboring towns. How are Doty students currently perform performing compared to peers in other communities, and how does growth data compare. Um, what about other data, including social emotional learning and school climate? Our community needs really great answers to these questions so that we can actually think about what is best for our kids, which is what we all want. Thank you so much for your work to help us understand the data that is driving your decision making. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Riley went, but I see uh, Riley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to mute yourself? Yes, I do. I was misnamed. I was Riley and realized that I was misnamed. I apologize for the confusion. Um, my name is Laura Lee Curavu. I'm a Berlin resident, a parent of a student at U32, and a teacher at Callis Elementary. I'm speaking today about the idea of reconfiguring our schools and the three models presented by the committee. In all three scenarios, two of the school communities, Callis and Worcester, appear to be consumed by the largest, uh, by the nearest larger school. And maybe my terminology isn't accurate, but that feeling is accurate by many. Um, consumed, a larger school swallowing a smaller nearby one. Those of us who work at Callis feel a deep emotional connectedness to it. Since the presentation of configuration options, there's been an unsettled feeling in the building. What will happen to the Callis Cougars? The staff works very hard every day to build community in our buildings. So how will that change when we are folded into another school? Everything about a reconfiguration seems to take away the Callis identity. So I ask as you move forward with conversations that are important to the fiscal responsibility of our district, that you were very thoughtful and sensitive to the way these ideas are presented. If we must merge schools, then these new schools need brand new identities. They will need a new name, new mascot, and time to help make the transition for two currently individual communities to build one common community and connectedness, which is the number one goal stated in the packet that you received about configuration options. Just today, students came to school talking about how their parents had told them they'll be attending East Montpelier School next year. Word is out, but it's not accurate. As you move along with exploring the possibilities, please be very sensitive to the fact that you aren't simply joining two buildings. You're merging two strong communities who have two strong beliefs about their children's education. And is there a plan to find alignment between them instead of creating more diversity? I ask you to think about how you foresee merging these two separate communities into one agreeable school community. How can you be sure that it won't feel like Cal has simply moved into East Montpelier School and Community? This merging is a big ask of all communities involved and it's also emotional for everyone involved. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Anybody else? Oh, there, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Lauren Schlow and I'm a Worcester resident and a parent of two Jody students. And I wanna thank everyone here for all of your work to support our schools. I'd like to echo my support um, for the, from some other comments for the need for clear communication of the potential cost savings of closing schools and specific guarantees of what the increased op opportunities are of closing uh, these two schools for our students. I understand that this will take time for the administration to develop, but it's really important for uh, me and our residents to have a full picture of what folks are voting on and um, getting on board or not on board with. Um, and for my perspective, while the idea of an extra music class, which is what is the increased opportunity that I've heard, um, sounds like a great opportunity for my students, please understand that this comes at a cost 
where other opportunities that already exist, sorry, for known students, like engaging with the community lunch program at the town hall, and that is just one example. Okay. Now, this, while this experience doesn't fit into the EQS, which is what the consolidated or configuration study seems to um, be going heavily on, which is the educational quality standards. So the experience of going and interacting with their community and planning a meal and serving that meal fits nowhere in the EQS. I would argue it's just as valuable, if not more, for some of our students, if not all of them, than the opportunity to learn an instrument in elementary school. So as an additional ask, I would ask that the committee or administration develop a draft schedule that includes these increased opportunities because the school day is only so long. The school day is not getting longer. So if we have more opportunities in our school day, those are coming at the cost of something else. So if we have extra music, what are we losing for that? So again, I thank you for the time, and I know it's a lot of work, but we need a lot of information. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's move on now. Oh, go ahead there. Hi. My name is Sarah Bell. I'm also a Worcester resident. Um, we moved into the district a few years ago, and specifically we moved into Worcester because of how close we were to our elementary school. Um, and ever since being there, we have realized how magical Dodie is. Um, our, my students, I've got two kids, nine and six, and um, we've moved through a lot as a family, and we have felt very well supported and loved and cared for by this very small community that just took us in. Mm -hmm. um, and not that that wouldn't happen in Emerge, but there's so many things, like what Lauren was just saying. Um, my son today, he's nine, he came home beaming about how we got to make soup for the community lunch, and he was so proud, and I just love the multi-generational aspect of our small schools and of the, the mixed grades that we have, the involvement with the community. Um, I know like these things are very emotional for everyone and I understand change is very important and things move and shift. I think like if, if we have to move in that direction, that's a really big gift because I do not want to lose Dobby. As, and I'm hearing the same, you know, with Callis too. Like this is a very emotional decision and I, I really want to make sure that that is also being weigh very heavily that these are human beings, we are not robots. You know, these are families with, with delicate kids who have already been through a lot of transition with COVID. You know, my students have not ever really had a consistent schooling um, just with that transition. Um, and and I'm, I'm just wondering if my ask would be, as we explore reconfiguration, what would be the supports in place for the students to, um, to make that transition? because I feel like that's gonna to have to be built in as, as we've discussed, you know, it's like one, one school is consuming a smaller school and you can't just like expect, you know, those two things to merge seamlessly. So I'm, I'm wondering what are the, the real tangible um, implements that we could put in place to support our students emotionally, specifically. I'm, I'm a big thing, you know, like, how are we feeling in our bodies? How are we feeling in our, in our feelings? Um, and, and making sure kids are feeling safe in that, like truly, because like kids are not able to to learn if they're feeling unsafe, if they're not if they're not knowing, if everything's brand new, you know, all the time. Um, I, I just want to make sure that you know if if we are merging schools, you know, are there going to be familiar teachers? Are you know is there going to be some sense of familiarity? And I really love the idea of like yeah, a new mascot, like a new a new community being created rather than just being consumed. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really important. You know, and I'm, I'm trying to be open to that possibility because I understand that money is a real thing. Um, and nobody wants to do this. This is not the choice anybody wants to do. If there are ways to prevent it, I would love that option. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. You guys are navigating a really difficult, very highly emotional um, decision. So I, I really thank you for all the work that you're putting in. I feel like I was just telling Lauren, I feel like I've kind of been under a rock a lot. Just in our own world, we get in our own world. So. Um, grateful for have the opportunity to share my thoughts. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. I think that's all the community input that, that we have. So we're going to move into our board operation. And we have our students with us today for the flag request on page four.
I'm wondering, where are you guys? Meg, I see you. And you Yolanda, are you here? <coughs> it looks like Vaughn is. Oh, oh, Vaughn, yeah. OK, I will let you guys, uh, Meg, you're upside down. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's pretty incredible if you are in outer space. Uh, but, oh, hey. I can see you, Yolanda. You guys, please, this is your time. Please go ahead and make your presentation. We have um, some, well, I'm upside down, but I know that the students in SSJ are not. So I see <laughs> Vaughn and Mela and um, Ace, if you want to um, go ahead with your presentation. Thanks for hearing us. <laughs> okay, so I can start. Um, I'm Mela. I'm in 10th grade. I'm a representative from Seeking Social Justice um, with our proposal to re-raise the Progress Pride flag. So in 2022, we raised the Progress Pride flag to represent a commitment to make the U32 a safe and inclusive learning environment for LGBTQ plus students and staff. Since then, we have continued to raise awareness of discrimination and educate our community on how to be inclusive. In the past, this has included presenting to middle schoolers on what it means to be LGBTQ plus and answering their questions, meeting and discussing with elementary students about their questions around the LGBTQ community, as well as meeting with staff to answer their questions, presenting to the district during the January in-service on inclusivity and creating a website with resources to help make classrooms more inclusive, presenting on youth organizing at the Education Justice Coalition's first conference in March and organizing walkouts and celebrations to celebrate LGBTQ plus students and staff. This year, we plan to call back discussion from May 22nd to receive comments from students about what they would like to see in the future. Students shared that having gender neutral pronouns on field trip forms, increasing staff education on the LGBTQ plus community and training to respond to homophobic incidents at school, more education for students on the LGBTQ plus community, especially for middle schoolers, more inclusion and representation of the LGBTQ plus community in class curriculums were some of the many ideas for further improvement to make U32 a safe and inclusive learning environment for the LGBTQ plus students and staff. U32 has an obligation to provide all students with a safe and supportive learning environment. This requires that all students, including LGBTQ plus students, feel welcome and supported at U32. Flying an LGBTQ plus pri progress pride flag is an important step towards making U32 a safe learning environment for LGBTQ plus students and brings an increased awareness of LGBTQ plus inclusivity and rights in our curriculum and practices and policies. We believe that there is still a lot of work to be done to help make the district more inclusive. The Progress Pride flag holds us accountable to keep striving for equity and shows the community that we value LGBTQ plus people and their rights. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Vaughn to talk about demonstrated student support. Uh, yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. Yeah, just making sure my audio is working. Uh, we sent out an anonymous survey to uh, high school students and middle school students. Um, and out of the 83 responses, 61, that's 73%, uh, supported re-raising the flag. 10% of the total responses noticed positive change since the flag has been raised. And among eighth graders, 38% noticed uh, positive change in their time at school. Uh, several responses included the flag were being raised, uh, since it was raised, sorry, since the flag being raised, teachers have started being better at pronouns and asking for them in the beginning of classes, and that students in general have been uh, more conscious about correct pronoun use. However, the survey did receive a large number, or not a large, but some homophobic responses and comments which need to be addressed, um, as well as sentiments uh, which asked for more transparency to students about administrative processes about responding to hate speech. Uh, there's still, as we said above, lots of work that needs to be done, but we would hope that you would, seeing all this support, raise the pride flag on June 5th, Wednesday. During callback, I believe, yes. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, jo Jolanda, are you gonna go next and then we can discuss after? Does that, does that make sense? And we do both? Okay. Yeah, that Go sounds ahead. good. So my name is Yolanda. I'm a senior at U32. I'm here to represent BLAM. 
in our proposal to re-raise the Black Lives Matter flag. And so the Black Lives Matter flag was first raised in 2018, which is a pretty long time ago. And essentially what it represents is solidarity with students of all backgrounds, especially with students of color, as well as showing that U32 as a school is committed to keeping our community educated on racism and how to be anti-racist in order to create a safe space and welcoming environment for people of color within U32 and the district in general. So BLAM has continued to act according to this goal by educating the U32 and district community on racism and how to be anti-racist. And we've done this especially through our middle school, uh, elementary school and staff workshops on racism, where we've worked with students from all grades, as well as with staff on what racism look like looks like in various forms, as well as how to shut it down and prevent those behaviors within classrooms and social circles. And we've also uh, worked with some, worked on some initiatives such as our Black History Month speaker series and our Orange Shirt Day walkout to raise awareness on Native American residential schools. And those were planned, again, to raise awareness on historical events, as well as uplift uh, Black community members as a demonstration of BLAM's continuous commitment to creating and fostering an inclusive U32 environment. And we did also recently have a callback discussion with students to ensure that people understand why the Black Lives Matter flag is raised, what it means to be raised and the actions that should follow uh, the flag being raised and like what BLAM needs to do, what the school needs to do to ensure that we are living up to that goal of standing in solidarity with students of color, especially uh, black students. And so our proposed date and time for raising progress, not progress, flag, the Black Lives Matter flag is February of next year during callback, just to coincide with Black History Month. And as for demonstrated student support, we also sent out a anonymous form to all students at U32, middle school and high school. And we as well also got 83 responses, coincidentally. And uh, about 80% of students were in support of the Black Lives Matter flag being re-raised. And we also did get a few racist comments, but they weren't like too many. Uh, as for <clears throat> comments that students had, a really big comment that students had was due to the fact that the Black Lives Matter flag was raised so long ago, it would be, it would be very harmful to students of color to take it down at this point. And what students said was that it would essentially mean that U32 has kind of solved racism and that it's not really an issue that the school really would really need to focus on anymore. So that was one big, that was a common theme we saw in form responses as well as during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. <clears throat> Board. We have two approvals. I move that we approve the raising of the progressive pride flag and the raising of the black flag, Black Lives Matter flag. Second. So okay, right moved, moved by mm -hmm. Ursula, second by Amelia. Is that not heard of that, right? Uh, and I would move to amend as an expression of the board's views on the matter to avoid any as what? First Amendment, to avoid it becoming a public the flag, all becoming a public own board. It's, good. it's we're expressing the board's views on those matters by this motion in support of our students, yes. but yes. it's the board's expression. Yes. Okay. okay. You can ask, ask yeah. Them. I mean, is this a, are we doing this to legally cover ourselves? Yes. So that we don't create a public open board that then other views can solicit, you know, equal mm -hmm. space. Agreed. Okay. okay. Any more discussion? I, I first wanted to thank the students for, for being here and for being so eloquent. It, there's a lot.
There's a lot of work that we still do not do uh, at our district to to continue to advance these issues and a lot of work that we need to do with our communities and a lot of work that we need to do ourselves to learn all those nuggets that we should be learning for you, for the students, so that you're not always <coughs> always doing the work. Uh, but we're committed to making our schools uh, inclusive and making sure that everybody feels welcome in our in our schools. So with that, I want to uh, all I those also say, um, you know, I appreciated the um, the survey <coughs> results and the details around that, and um, it is concerning as a board member to to hear uh, negative comments on that. And as you said, you want not too many, but even one is too many. And so we as a board need to be sure that we're continuing to provide that, that support. I have a comment. In the written request, the students have requested a potential change to the policy. And I'm curious if the policy committee is willing to look at that. Um, I would, yes, we'll pick it up. To move the report to the approval. And invite students to come um, and talk to us. That was my comment. OK. okay. Uh, with that, uh, the. You know, the Black Lives Matter flag, especially, is a very personal issue for myself. So I'm just so proud of that work that you guys have been doing. I remember June 4th, 2018, like it was yesterday. And I remember the students especially saying that there was, that this was just a flag. It didn't mean that the work didn't need to happen. And I'm, we have a justice coalition now, but there's still so much work that needs to be done, not just by our students, but by our staff. And, and we, this is a call for all of us to make sure that we are doing that by, you know, it's just a symbol, but it represents our values. So thank you again for being here. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Bye. We're going to move into our board agencies interviews. This is very exciting. We have two potential board members today with us. Uh, we have Patrick online because he's uh, uh, away for work. And we have Elizabeth with us. Uh, we had a, two more applicants. And I forwarded that email to all of you. And they have withdrawn their application. So uh, Elizabeth, <laughs> it's, uh, it's you. So. The way, and I had shared the questions, I had sent them for questions, and we were going to ask one question that they didn't know today. But I was wondering if we could start by you summarizing uh, the four questions. So the four questions for the public to know it was, what, uh, what motivates you to want to become a school board member? The other one was, what particular skills or expertise are you going to share with us that will help us serve, uh, that will help you serve as a school board member? Uh, how long have you lived in this school district? Uh, and are you willing to attend workshops and, and training to becoming a better school board member? So if you could just summarize, I don't want to ask the four questions, just summarize because you had some time to think about it. Sure, sure. Uh, and then we'll ask one more question. And I did take notes, so that's Go what ahead. I'm looking at. I'm not yeah. doing emails or anything. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. So what motivates me? Um, I am a parent of three children in our district. I have twin six-year-olds who are at Callis, and I have a 12-year-old at U32. Um, and I'm excited and motivated to be a part of the change that the school board is, is dealing with. Um, as somebody who has worked in education for many, many years, um, I'm currently the Director of Early Education for the Barry Unified Union School District. I feel really strongly that engagement, debate, conversation, and collaboration must happen in order for decisions to be made intentionally, and we owe it to our constituents to do that as well. Um, I am motivated to be a voice for my community, and also to be an active listener to those who have concerns, thoughts, and ideas. I'm a big believer that um, when decisions are made with lots of different views and perspectives, they are much more meaningful and impactful in a positive way. Um, I am acutely aware of the upcoming critical decisions this board has to make. Um, it is not easy. It is going to be hard work. Um, and I really enjoy challenges, and I really enjoy hard work. Um, I'm a human lover. I work with young children, and I also really enjoy working with adults. And so 
um, having the opportunity to, to work with adults closely and professionally is also really exciting. Um, so particular skills, as I shared, I've been in the field of education for many years, for about 15 years in leadership. Um, I was an executive director of a nonprofit organization where I worked very closely with a board of directors. Um, it was one of my most enjoyable parts of my job, primarily because I had a board that challenged me professionally, which I really enjoyed, and I learned a lot. Um, I also found that there were many opportunities and many times where we had to make really big decisions, and many of those decisions were very much a Pandora's box. You make one choice, and then it impacts five others. And so having more brains was always really helpful for me as an executive director. Um, I'm really passionate about, about money, <laughs> about um, um, sustainability, and about um, being able to really look at and balance the needs of our community as well as the needs of our district because it's big. It's, it, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. And um, at my previous position, when I was an executive director, I started my position and there was $85 in savings. And I said, oh my gosh, we've got to work on this. Um, and in the six years that I worked there, I was able to increase the, um, the savings to about $350,000. And that was a very small Nonprofit, And so I get excited by numbers. I get excited by thinking about ways to manipulate and change numbers in order to meet the needs of the people that are in our community. Um, I've lived in the school district uh, for four years, actually. I've lived in the school district for four years. Our children have attended schools for three years just because of COVID. Um, our children were not in school the first year that we were here. We wish we had um, enrolled them in that year. I will tell you, if we could go back, we would have enrolled them. <laughs> For a lot of reasons. But Calus is an amazing place, and uh, we want as much as we can get out of it. Um, am I willing to learn and attend workshops? Absolutely. I think that is a responsibility of an effective board member, is learning and growing. Um, I am a lifelong learner in all the things I do, including parenting. I'm learning a lot, um, but I believe very much that in order to be able to be an active participant, um, an impactful participant, you must understand the nuances and the intricacies of being a board member. And thankfully, I've, I've done it. Um, I've had the opportunity to work um, currently in my role, as well as as the executive director, directly with boards on budgets. Um, and with that, have, there have been hard decisions, but I've always felt really good about the decisions we've made because they have been done with careful, intricate, fine-toothed comb examination and consideration. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Is there anything else I didn't answer? No, those were the four questions, okay. and the question that I didn't send was, uh, what role does public education play in the future of Vermont? Oh my gosh. You know, when I think about budgets and I think about all the things that school districts have to do, I think about the investment in our future. And our world is changing all the time. So much in education. Um, I've been in the field for a long time, and when COVID hit, I remember thinking, things are going to be so different when we go back. Um, and they are, and they are for a lot of different reasons, and I feel that public education and access to public education that's high quality is critical to our future. Vermont specifically, I come from California, Southern California. Vermont is a small state, and it's a small state that needs a lot. Um, and we need to build children up in a way that they can contribute to the future of our, of our state. We want critical thinkers, thinkers that are thinking outside the box, educators who are challenging children in a developmentally appropriate way, but pushing them beyond what they think they can do so that when they get into the workforce, when they are making those changes, they are going to be strong enough to do so. Um, and I feel like, you know, public education, I remember when we, so we used to spend summers in Calus at my mom's home, and we would always drive by Calus Elementary, and we would always see the little sign, and I remember we were like, we're going to have kids, and one day they're going to go to Calus Elementary. And we could put our children in a private school, but we want them in a public school. We want them to have exposure to different ideas. 
Um, we want them to be able to be who they are amongst their community. And so I feel like public education is really paramount to our future. And I, I want everybody to be as invested in it as I am and as my family is. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And Patrick, are you, can you mute yourself? There you are. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. I, I'm wondering if you want to summarize. Did you hear the directions for Elizabeth? Do you want to summarize the four questions that we sent you ahead of time? And I'm sure. happy to go over them if you don't have them right in front of you. Nope, I, I have them. That's fine. Um, okay. And introduce so yourself. The, yeah. yeah, My so my name is Patrick Welly. Um, I live in Middlesex. Um, um, I have a child who's going to be a first grader next year and a child who's going to be a third grader next year, um, at, at Rumney. Um, and what motivates me to, uh, raise my hand and be hopefully a member of the, the school board. Um, first of all, it's those guys. Um, but it's also what we heard from the students in this meeting before this agenda item, um, our community is an amazing community and they deserve a strong school board uh, that um, advocates for the best education that that our community uh, can provide. Um, I think that that schools are, of course, first um, responsibility is to educate our kids, but also to be um, beacons in our community and, and uh, places that our community uh, can get together and enjoy each other's company. Um, and I think that that if I was uh, fortunate enough to be uh, on the school board, I would advocate for things uh, that would promote those kinds of behavior. Um, I've I've lived on in Middlesex on Wood Road for six mud seasons. That's how I mark time up <laughs> Wood Road. Um, like my neighbors do. <laughs> um, skills that I have that I think would be helpful. Um, I'm a I'm a research scientist. Um, I'm not a, I'm not an educator um, by profession, but I have, um, while Elizabeth, you said you really like um, to, to look at budgets, I really like to look at data just full stop. So I would be a member of the board that would pour over spreadsheets and question charts and really help uh, to understand what, what the data are saying whether that is um, good news or bad news, because um, I know from from the work that I do that data don't care about your feelings, they just are what they are. So um, <laughs> understanding the data is a really important thing to make better decisions based on those data. So that's what I would help with. Um, I'm also a member of the board of the Vermont River Conservancy, um, and I've been on that board for almost uh, for four years. So I, I kind of know how boards work. It's not a school board but I come in with a little bit of experience um, in, in nonprofit boards. Um, all of my education um, has been in public, uh, public schools. Um, and my parents, uh, when I was growing up, worked in public schools. My father was a school psychologist and my mom was a, a school nurse. So I, I value um, the public schools and I understand what they can be. And I just want to, I want to help. There's a, there's a, a space, uh, an open space in, in my town and in this community. And I think that I can be helpful um, to the school board. Did I get everything on the, on the list? I, I yeah. think, I think you did. Yeah. Okay. And the, the last question was uh, what role does public education play in the future of Vermont? Yeah. So I'm, I'm concerned um, that the, the appetite for public education in Vermont is is uh, under attack. A lot of budgets didn't pass this year on the first try or the second try. Um, but I think it's I think it's essential for us to have public education. I think it's essential for our kids to go to public schools or, or at, at the very least have an option that is a really, really good option to go to public schools. And I think that we're at a crossroads in our community when we're trying to figure out how we can afford the schools that we have or how, how can we afford to educate our kids in our community with the resources that we have. And um, I, I think that, I think that I can help with that in our, in our community. Um, part of my job is, is to get people 
to um, from 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 different with different agendas or different um, needs out of their out of whatever the work that is that, that they're doing and get them together and try to go in the same direction so that we can have a productive uh, field expedition. That's not what we're doing on a school board, but I think that that, that experience is gonna be really helpful to, for our community to come together with different needs, different wants, and then and then come out of that conversation with, productive, with a productive school district. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I think Thank you. That, that, I think that answers all the questions, and I think you you mentioned the River Conservancy, and you probably have just because I know them all. We have Geo, Lou, and Scylla, and they're probably three of the best school board members that I've ever worked with. <laughs> so we <coughs> would be getting yeah, a lot of, <laughs> and they're from around the state. Yeah. So I, we were now expected to go into executive session. Yeah, but we have just one applicant from Calis and one because the other two yeah, withdrawn and one applicant from uh, from Middlesex. So I'm wondering, is it still best practice to go into executive session or do you want a motion? I think it would be if the board feels you like you need, need to discuss. To discuss. Yeah. You would want so to that's that. why that's why I'm posting the question. Yes. You what? Go. I think yeah. To go into executive session? No, 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 no. no, no. no, no. no, no. Okay. Well, so, I, I, yes. So, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. So can we have a, a, a motion to appoint Elizabeth and Patrick? So, so moved. Oh, okay. Second. So, wait. So moved by, uh, by Diane. Second. By Chris. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Well, sure. welcome. Before. Yes. Yes. Before all the Worcester people leave, I just want to remind <laughs> people that there is a open open seat in Worcester. So <laughs> if anyone online, <laughs> tell your friends. Tell your friends. Just send a letter. All you have to do is write a letter. Thank you. Yeah. Really okay. good. Danny. I was just going to move to suspend. Robert's rules to allow our newly elected members, if they so choose, to fully engage in the conversation this evening. Understanding they're not sworn in yet and can't vote. But yeah, yeah I had told them that I, I had told them that they could stay engaging. through the meeting if they wanted. Yeah. I, I still have one question. Patrick, are you still there? It's a very specific question. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have uh, later in our uh, actually, it's right, actually now, right now. It's actually right now we are going to be appointing a Central Vermont Carrier Center yeah. representative. Uh, Joshua, who was in uh, also from the Middlesex area, uh, just uh, is moving, so he's not going to be there. And I was the representative before, and we're looking. I had sort of talked with others, and I'm looking for somebody. And I was thinking with your expertise and uh, the industry, if you would be willing to serve. So, before, yeah, him being on the river conservancy, you just placed the hook. I, um, well, so I, uh -huh. no, 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 he's <laughs> well, the money well, evaporator, well, there's more, I'm there's not, more, <laughs> there's more, so I'm, I'm not trying to put you like a new format, but I, I am. <laughs> In some ways, you have come to the career center it's before. It's not a real uh, fly. <laughs> <laughs> would you be willing to serve? Would that role involve? Is it, um, so yeah. it's, it's one meeting a month, uh, they meet the second Monday. Of the, of the, I believe, yeah, they just changed, yeah, the second Monday, the second Monday, and um, that, and then you will report to the board, uh, the Career Center is our, uh, we have six sending, uh, six school districts uh, that go to the Vermont Career Center, uh, and that includes uh, Montpelier, uh, Harwood, uh, our Washington Central uh, District, uh, Cabot, um, now it's facing 18 towns. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would be it'd be um, interfacing with that in, in, in that organization and then re reporting back to the board um, what the yeah. Meeting. So you would be a full board member uh, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think okay. I, can do that. I think I can do that. Um, I'd be happy to. Okay. Great. All right. So uh, 
our next item in the agenda is 3.3 .3 to appoint, and, and I will work with you, so I wouldn't, you know, I'll work with you, so, and I'll give you more feedback on that. A, a, appoint a Central Vermont Career Center representative. Could I have a motion? I move that we appoint Patrick Wheely, Welly um, to the Central Vermont Career Center. Thank you, Ursula. A, a sec second by Amelia. It's like, it's like, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> this is a million. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. And now, Megan, we're going to move into our best part of the evening in All some right. way. Well, we have so many. We've been setting up ourselves for this. <laughs> we started the best part with the students, and now. <laughs> Equity indicators. So I'm going to kick us off. Um, two people were like raising their hands. So we have most of the leadership team who will help jump in. This is a joint presentation. Um, I want to start, and I know that I think most of the students have come off, but um, it is a very happy sort uh, coincidence that this request, their request, landed on the same night that we are talking about our equity indicators because I think that um, one of the things that they have talked about is the importance of this work being important for this district. Um, and also want to point out that this is this is evidence, and you'll see evidence in this presentation, that not only is this district committed to it, but they have put that commitment into policy, which is how you solidify that commitment. And I also would acknowledge that the students see this as a real, the flags as a really important signal, but they're also a call to action because we are not where we need to be and we need to continue to work. And this is a really important part of continuing that work. So um, I think I could not have picked a better uh, intro to this presentation. So here is what we will do today. Oh, thank you. I always forget that. Here's the slides. Thank you. Um, we'll do a little bit of background. Uh, where has our equity work been? How did this get into policy? Um, and a little bit about the equity indicators. Kind of just an overview because you have seen a report on the indicators. Then we will go through our data. Um, an important piece of this presentation, um, you've heard us talk a lot and you'll hear us talk again. This data needs to be part of your education quality monitoring system because it is an incredible amount of data. So what we will do today is show you what this data looks like so that we can make some meaning of it, help give you some insight into how we use the data and what our recommendations are. It's not a deep dive into each piece of data, um, and you'll see why over the course of it. So we will do that, we will talk about recommendations, and then you will have a little bit of an opportunity to debrief with a specific focus on is this giving you what you need to monitor your policy? Because that's really what it's for. All right. So I'm going to transition to a little historical look back that Stephen will start with. Well, thank goodness Yolanda already presented some of this. So, um, so I, was, I really appreciate that. That was completely uncoordinated as well. But um, the grassroots work, of, um, as Yolanda mentioned, really started when the students came forward to um, to get us to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. This is when we, we would say that the formal process of adding equity as a part of our work in a, in a very um, coherent way um, really began with our, our students uh, bringing that issue up. And so you can see where we started the grassroots work, moved then into the Humanity and Justice Coalition being formed. Um, we had our equity scholar in residence um, came up around during that time period as well, um, moving through our, our board district policy. And now we're getting to the point where we, how do we monitor that kind of work that we're doing? So really moving from the grassroots to a more formal way of us keeping track of this throughout the time um, that our students are here and the work that we do. 
You, as a board, are quite familiar with this statement, and I know that it is unreadable on here, um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this, because you adopted this statement as a board before you even put it in policy. Um, so it's a pretty strong affirmation of um, your belief system, and again, it's aspirational. It's something we're working for. And then this next slide is one fifth of our strategic plans of uh, vision and values that we have as a school district, our core values. And so, um, so we really have ingrained this work now into our future planning um, and what it means to, uh, for us as a district, what are we focused on? And so I'm not gonna read this one to you, but, um, but remember it's one part of our strategic plan now so that we, we do incorporate all of this work into the other aspects of rigorous curriculum and instruction, the well-being, the community engagement, and our, a transparent governance. And so the, the two different ways that boards codify the work of any work actually, but codify what's important to them is through strategic planning, but also through policy. Mm -hmm. And last year you adopted an equity policy, as you know, um, there's much more to the policy, but I did want to zero in on your definition of what educational equity is. Um, and I'm just gonna read the beginning part because I think that's the most um, salient statement, but educational equity occurs when each student receives what they need to develop to their full academic and social emotional potential. Equity goes beyond formal equality, where all students are treated the same. And working towards equity in schools involves expecting high outcomes for all participants in our educational system and removing the predictability of success or failure that currently correlates with any social or cultural factor. Identify and remove inequitable practices, examining biases, and creating inclusive multicultural school environments for adults and children. Providing every student with access to high quality, culturally responsive educational experiences and discovering and cultivating the unique gifts, talents, and interests that every human possesses. Um, it's a pre I think it's pretty exciting to be part of a district that believes this for our kids, even though we know that we're still working to get there. Um, but so that is your policy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about something that is actually more universal than just your equity policy, and that is your role in monitoring the work of the district. So that first line is from your equity policy. Your policy charges me, uh, or charges the superintendent, to identify indicators as necessary for monitoring, and that we, collectively, as a leadership team, provide you an annual status report. And as I've shared, our recommendation is that that gets embedded into your structures for monitoring. But this is what you do with data, and that's true whether you're looking at equity data or any other piece of data. We identify indicators and we report that to you. And you give us feedback on that to make sure that it's giving you what you need. Um, you are allowed to say, I'm not learning what I need to learn from the data you're showing us, and we go back and forth on that. The second part that you do as a board is understand what we are doing in relation to that data. Our job is to explain what we do, and your job is to understand that, again, give input, but also communicate that to the community. So when the community says, well, I don't think you're meeting this equity policy, what are you doing about it? You have an ability to speak to it. Those two things together kind of form that balanced governance. And if you remember back to Phil Gore working with you, that is sort of where that comes from. But this is a good time to remind you of this piece because this is all about data. There's a lot of information here, and this is kind of uh, monitoring is one of your core functions as a board. So you've gotten uh, this presentation before, or you've gotten this as a report, and you've also had a chance to give input. I am, so I'm gonna kinda go quickly through the next few slides. This is what these indicators are. So when we, uh, when, when I'm taking this policy and saying it's my job to identify indicators to measure this, we convened a design team uh, to do the work to identify these. Uh, we did a lot of research. Um, we looked at how other schools measure equity. We're not the first school district to pass an equity policy and say, how do we measure it? So we looked at a lot of ways that schools measure equity. Um, we identified some draft uh, indicators. 
they fall into these three categories because data, traditional data, is one really important piece, but it's not the only piece to be able to give you a broad picture. Um, so we've circled around the idea of we need to look at outcomes data. That's the data that's going to feel most number-like to you. Um, what's the impact? What's actually happening at the end based on all of our work? But we're also going to look at experiences. What are the things that people, and that's students and adults in our system, experience? What things interrupt injustice and allow us to thrive? We're also going to look at what implementation. What are we doing? Right, so those three things together is how we've categorized this. We took our indicators and these concepts and we brought them out to multiple groups. You had an opportunity, our Humanity and Justice Coalition, students, multiple student groups. We sort of went back to them several times. Um, and like any piece of work, this is where we've landed for right now. And you as a board and us as a leadership team will probably continue to refine it. You've seen this chart before. I'm going to talk about a couple of things. So these are really important ways that we have identified to measure this. We also know that we don't have all this data in hand right now. So one of our initial recommendations is we need to work on being able to give you all of this data. So some of what we have here, and up in the slides they're marked with asterisks, we don't have that data right now. But we think it's a really important thing for the district to start collecting. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that so that, so that you know which pieces you're not going to see in this presentation. And one of our recommendations is that we start developing ways to collect this data. On the outcome side, we have a lot of data. You review a lot of data. What we don't have at our fingertips in all areas is the ability to disaggregate the data. And disaggregating the data is the most important part of what makes it an equity indicator, because we need to look at whether or not identity groups predict your performance. Um, so you'll see there's an asterisk. There's actually not an asterisk, but there should be on graduation rate. We have graduation rates. We're going to show you a slide. We don't have disaggregated graduation rate data. That's one of the things we want to work on. SEL benchmark data. So social emotional learning benchmarks would be sort of the standards. It's what we're teaching kids around social emotional learning. We don't measure that universally. We do measure behavior and referrals. So we measure when we don't see good skills. Um, but we do think it will be important for you to start receiving measures on the skills we're teaching kids and um, what those look like. Some of our dual enrollment, early college, co-curricular participation, these are pieces of data we know are really important and we want to see whether or not identity group predicts that. Um, so, but we, you won't see that in this presentation. Under experiences, we will, talk, we will go through our climate survey data. Um, that is the data that we have to present to you. We also know from our feedback, particularly from students, that they believe, and we agree, that how, what people experience is a really important part of this. And we would like to create a structure to do focus group interviews, partially with students, also potentially with people who leave our system, um, and find out why. That is not a structure we have yet, but we want to develop that so that you can receive that information in the future. Again, to round out the numbers part of this. On the right-hand side, you will get a report of what we've done so far this year around our equity work. But the things that we know we need to do is we've done a lot of learning around auditing our curriculum using an equity lens, but we don't have reports to do that. So that is, that is a future next step. We also know and are working with the association on um, workforce demographics and the extent to which our teacher goals are tied to equity. Um, we're figuring out, we don't collect that information right now on our workforce. Uh, so we're figuring out how we could serve that. We want the students in our schools to see themselves in our staff um, so that we don't have that data yet, but we think it's really important. That, I think enough about the indicators because you have seen that report before. So we're going to move into several slides, and I should have actually preceded this entire presentation. There's a lot here. We're going to be talking a lot. We will give you time at the end to kind of digest it. 
but the weightiness of this report is part of why it really is something you should stretch over the course of a year. Because there's a lot to digest here, and I would say you won't be able to probably go as deep into each of these areas as you might want to. Um, I also think it's important to kind of help the board or remind the board what we think about data. Um, Patrick sort of said, said this, um, data itself doesn't have feelings, but we know people have feelings about data, right? We know that when they see things, especially things related to equity, they, it generates feelings. We understand data, and we're trying to get our system to understand data as just that. It's information that we get, we look at, we react to, and analyze, and we do something about. And we want that to feel really safe, um, but we just acknowledge it's, it's, uh, it's not, doesn't feel safe, frankly, to everyone, but that's how we see it. So when we show data, we show you the good and the bad, because that is, that, A, that's our job, but also that's how we want people to be comfortable with it. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Gillian. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm having vision limitations. <laughs> It's very small up there. It's very small, and I was not prepared to be. I, I didn't think about like scale. Like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm a good, good gentleman. So I'm very excited about that. If you'd like to buy a vowel, I'm all set. <laughs> uh, so, just as a general note, before we start the presentation, and this is sort of a, this is going to be a lot of information dump before you, we're all going to be following the same sort of protocol, thinking about what is it that we see, what questions do we, do, does this data raise for us, um, what's significant about it, and what are the implications for our work. So each of us will be following the same pattern. In the disaggregation of the data, um, I do want to point out one thing in terms of the definition that we are using of historically marginalized students. The, um, in, for the purposes of this presentation, is not the same as the Agency of Education definition for historically marginalized students. This data, in this data, the term historically marginalized refers to our black and brown students. So, this is our iReady reading growth data. So the iReady is an assessment that we give three times a year. Students take it in the fall. iReady generates a score. And it also then generates uh, growth targets. So there is growth, and then there is stretch growth. Um, and so what's important to understand that this is not these targets for growth are not based on standards or grade level benchmarks, but on student progress, on individual student progress. And so what we're looking for, and this is our winter data, and so what we're looking for in our winter data is we're looking for um, at least 50%, for these numbers to hover around 50%. We want our students to be halfway towards their goals for growth and stretch growth. So in this chart, it's the percentage that's proficient or above. Uh, the brown line is typical growth, and then the gray line is the stretch growth. And it is a median, not a mode or a mean. So when we look at this um, data, what we, you know, when I look at it and you know, what I would be bringing to the table in a, in a conversation and so I'd say, wow, look at this. We've got a lot of kids really on target to make their annual growth. But we have a significant portion of kids who are not on target to make their annual growth. And so the noticing here is, well, you know, why aren't they? That's the question is, what is happening for these students in their experience that is impacting their ability to reach their annual growth targets? Um, one of the things that's really significant about this, particularly with our students who are on IEPs and receiving specialized instruction, the purpose of specialized instruction is to catch students up rather than keep up. And so what we would ideally like to see in our IEP students is that they are actually um, achieving more growth. 
because what we're trying to do is backfill and bring them up. So um, that is one of the things that's really significant about it. This is the group that we'd like to see the most growth out of, and we're not seeing the most growth out of it. So it's a noticing. It's a starting to think about what is it that we need to unpack. Some of the implications around this are looking at how are we develop, uh, delivering services to our students who are most in need of them. How are we delivering these catch-up services to our students? And one of the implications is that we need to think about how, when we're crafting and creating our daily schedules, how is it that we're building our schedules around student needs, then rather than fitting in student needs around schedule needs? How do you make the calendar student need driven? The other thing that I think is actually really super exciting about this and is a uh, very nerdy thought and implication is we started giving the I grade reading assessment the year before we fully implemented the foundations reading curriculum across the district. So what is really super exciting about this is that we have, albeit only one year, of pre-foundations um, data, but what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to use this as a tool that's been existent in the district and use it to sort of monitor and look at and see how uh, the implementation of foundations is impacting our students' literacy. Thank you, Gillian. And I should just remind board members, I forgot to say this, reading at grade three is a predictive measure. So that's why we're picking this. We have lots of literacy data, but reading at grade three is highly predictive of how you do later in life. Similarly, and then I'll turn it over to um, Celia and Caroline, algebra at grade eight, algebra concepts at grade eight are a highly predictive measure for math. So that's why we picked those. We talked about that before, but I, it's worth repeating. But I, can I just say too though that well, yes, it is highly predictive. I think as part of an equity lens, we need to push that needle to the fact that, because um, too often as a society, we say by grade three, if they're not doing X, Y, or Z, you know what I mean? A lot of people will throw in the hat. And so the critical piece of it being an equity lens is that we, we push on that and say, yes, this is informing us about instruction, but it also um, is an indicator, but we know we can still. Yeah, just to be clear, it does not mean we stop teaching. Yes. When we stop there. And it does not mean we stop intervening. Um, it's just statistically a measure that says that it's really important to know how you are doing by these grade levels. That's all. Thank you, Diane. And it's true in this slide as well. These <clears throat> are algebra concepts at eighth grade, but we look at data earlier and see algebra concepts and, and other things. So. Um, very nice you guys right? Yes. So, um, for the question, what do you see? Um, the percentage progress to annual typical growth, which is the orange bar, um, is the highest in all categories. And the percentage of students at or above standard, which is the blue bar, has the largest variability. So once we make those noticings, we ask what are these questions like what what questions does this raise for you and a few that we think about or that we were we were thinking about is how does historically marginalized and non-marginalized population how does that data break down by gender that's a question that i have um, and does it continue with the trend that seen here of females achieving at higher rates than their male counterparts another question that it raises is does this behavior data that Kat's going to talk about, um, or does this, uh, I'm sorry, does the behavior data that Kat is going to talk about have an impact on the discrepancy between genders? Okay, so that's another question. And then the after we kind of ask those general questions, we ask, like, what is significant, right? Um, and something that really jumped out to us was, that this data shows that we have a higher percentage of females to males making progress across all three categories. So it's just something that stuck out. Um, we also noticed that IEP uh, versus non-IEP has the largest discrepancy in proficiencies. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is more progress in growth for students who are on IEPs, um, which is what we would want to see. Um, what, what are the implications for our work? Um, we need to ensure that there are math routines implemented daily across all grade levels. Additionally, we should explore um, universal design learning practices that allow students to access and see themselves in our curriculum um, consistently. And lastly, we need to ensure that all students have access to their grade level math curriculum at all times, across all grade levels. Uh, I just said it wrong, not at all times, but across all grade levels, um, having some portion that they have access to their grade level curriculum is highly important. Thank you. So as Megan mentioned earlier about our graduation rates, you can see them here. Um, they are not disaggregated like the other um, um, pieces of data that we've seen so far. Um, and um, what we see in this data when we look at it is that overall that we have pretty much stayed with the Vermont four-year rate except for one year. And, um, and this brings up an interesting point about what is the four-year graduation rate versus the six-year graduation rate. If you arrive at U32 any time between your freshman year and graduation, um, that four-year span are the kids who are counted um, for our four-year graduation rate. And so if we had a senior show up today, um, they would be counted in our four-year graduation rate for this year. Um, and so, so it just is your four-year time span is all that it looks at um, for your time here. So when you look at 2020-2021, you see that 77% of our kids um, met the four-year graduation rate, which is a low number and certainly a cause of concern. And then when you look over to the six-year rate, we are at 88.6%, which is higher than the Vermont six-year rate. What typically happens is we have students who take longer to graduate based on additional needs or just additional time uh, for some of our kids, um, they may not graduate in that four-year time span and may um, indeed go to school an additional fifth or sixth year. And all of the fifth and sixth year students would be included in the six-year graduation rate. And there are a very limited, but there are a few students who stay beyond the six-year um, uh, graduation rate time period and they would never show up in the data um, as, uh, as completing the program here at U32. And, um, and so those are things that we look at. And what are the implications? I think our, our next big implication is really disaggregating this data. How do we look at this so that we look at uh, you know, marginalized communities, uh, male, female, um, certainly looking at that data in different ways so that we can say, are we missing uh, a group um, in this data that we need to address? Can I just ask a quick question? Yep. The male, female, that moving forward, is that self-identified or identified at birth? Currently, our data is what is in the system, which we have the ability to have that as how the student identifies. Yeah. Um, so yes. Thank you. That's a good yeah. quick clarifier. I do think in K6, it's parents who fill out that form yeah. and after that there's more of a chance as grade seven through twelve for it to be student driven. You worship families if yeah. but parents have the access to yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next several slides are kind of around behavior measures. So <laughs> so on this slide, what you're going to see, um, the blue and the orange lines, the blue lines um, represent the um, percent of the population across different groups that have had behavioral referrals. Um, if you're in an elementary school, you might hear ODRs or pink slips or whatever. It means that there's a referral to the office. Um, the orange line represents of that the population, six or more referrals have happened for those students. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, so the blue line is all students by group, and the orange line is, of that blue line, six or more referrals. So 82% of non-IEP students have been referred to the... No, 60%. So this, is, the, this is the demographic there, 17% of the population are on IEPs. Oh, that's oh, the that's 17%, 61 of those 17%. Can you say that for the whole crowd, Diane? Okay. That was oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, uh, in that same protocol that uh, Gillian talked about earlier, we're going to go through what do we see, what questions does it raise, what's significant, and what are the implications for our work. What we're seeing is not surprising. It's reminiscent of something that we talked about last spring. Students um, with IEPs, male students, um, students who meet the requirements for um, free and reduced lunch, and historically marginalized students have a disproportionate rate of referrals for behavior. Um, what questions that this raises for us is whether or not we really have consistency in our practices around um, the way that we report behavior for students who are eligible for special education. We suspect that this data can be skewed in both directions for a variety of reasons. Um, in some cases, we observe that students are overly reported because there's an IEP or a behavior plan and we're, getting, we're looking really closely at what's happening for them. For, um, for some students, some, sometimes it's underreported because staff are reluctant when there's a plan that's already in place and the team is working to address that behavior. Um, for the next question, what strikes you as significant? As we see here, the number of students who identify in the historically marginalized populations is very low in our district. So it seems significant to us that they are disproportionately identified in behavior data. Additionally, last spring, we looked at behavior data from the lens of the rising sixth grade class as a cohort. We saw the students most likely to show up in behavior referrals were then male, white, on an IEP, and identified as eligible for free and reduced lunch. This has not changed significantly since last year. That strikes us as significant. And additionally, what are the implications for our work? We recognize how important it is for our team to continue to collect and monitor and reflect on this data in light of our continued commitment to humanity, justice, community, and belonging. On the next slide, what you're going to see is an attendance summary. And what this um, slide represents is uh, the number of students across each group who have had 15 or more absences. Um, just like we saw with the behavior data, students on IEPs eligible for FRL, free and reduced lunch, um, and historically marginalized populations are disproportionately identified with 15 or more days of absences. Um, this raises numerous questions around how we are supporting students who are disproportionately represented and what more we can do to increase their attendance and engagement in our school community. Uh, what strikes us as significant is that we are seeing the same group of students with high absenteeism as we saw with the students who have more behavioral referrals. Um, a bit of us wondered, um, is there a correlation between the days of suspension or out of school days and absences, something we thought it would be useful to look at more closely? Um, and then what are the implications for our work? Uh, we recognize that we have work to do as a district related to how we address absences and engage with students and families and caregivers. Our approach related to how absences are coded is becoming more aligned, but we still have work to do in this area. Knowing why students are absent helps to inform how schools intervene, and this starts with the data we gather through our attendance procedures. Can I ask a quick question? Do the six behavior events in the 15 days, is that significant, or is that? I think that that is a really good question for us to be asking. I really think that, you know, we'll, you'll hear this, I think, repeated over time. We've done some wonderful data dives um, this year as a leadership team and as a district. And it's just, it's bringing to light that there's so much more information and that would be helpful for us to know because I do think that there are connections between all of these things. Mm -hmm. okay. Another, in addition, part of it is wanting to draw a line to represent something that is what we would sort of describe as outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. So especially when you talk about behavior referrals, we all stumble. So <laughs> putting all of the kids up who've had one or two so we were, but, but if you have, have six or more referrals, that's pretty significant. So that's another choice is just to say what we're really zeroing in on for this purpose is the students who are, who are we would say, struggling more. And everything Kat just said, because there's probably lots of really important information at the one referral level and two. Um, 
Which is also to say, this is a good time to kind of repeat, you're seeing a district-wide summary level of data. All of this team engages in the rest of what we talked about at their school level. And they do look at one, two, three, and four. And they certainly pay attention to attendance before kids miss 15 days, for sure. Um, this was just a, a, a way to, to kind of illustrate um, when we're really concerned. Is this being absent from one class? Like one absence, or is it? Good question. So, so it's uh, daily attendance okay, for okay. for students. <laughs> 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 Which now makes me want to go check it in. One one thing as you were talking that I was thinking about when you said like six days, one thing that we've talked a lot about as an admin team is also calibrating between elementary schools, like what qualifies as an ODR, right? And what is the is it an ODR that's just like you know, I needed to take some time away in my classroom and like I used some strategies and pulled myself back together. It is, if that's being written up and being collected as data, you don't want to like, so it's calibrating that so that we can pull it, so that when we're, we're, we're comparing apples and apples. So if Kat and I sit down and we say, things feel really rocky in our building right now, let's look at it. We are. We can talk about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas right now we're not, we're not totally there. We can, we have the same categories, but it, what my staff qualify as um, inappropriate language or something might be something different than her than her building. Right. So yeah. it's something that we're I think we're really working towards. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. Is this data out to like the, like all the public? So where would someone find this? I'm just wondering because as a student, if you see this data and you're in school and then someone starts to like, you notice someone starts to like mm -hmm. not show up yeah. and you're trying to be like, when do the school, when does the school step in? And if someone has a concern, they could, I don't know, there could be some connection there. So I was wondering if this is like something that someone could see. Yeah, that you're, the, you're, you're hitting a chord for me, like thinking about, there are some best practices about um, how we use the data to identify the need to intervene, right? Yeah. That's what Megan was trying to get at, yeah. which is um, in my building, I can see if a kid has had one or few, one or two referrals to the office, I'm hoping that the brain of their heart is gonna tell them to stop doing it and, right. <laughs> and get it together, right? But if I get to six, then I know I that that's solid evidence that I need to do something more. Yeah. But I'm the only one in my building or my behavior team that's really examining that data. I, and I love the way that you're getting me to think about attendance or behavior, mm -hmm. right? How do you show up for your peers? Right. Um, I don't know. But I actually love that you just made that suggestion because I, I think that <laughs> yeah. that is a place yeah. for us to start thinking about. Um, is there a place for peer groups to show up for each other? Yeah. And what is the mechanism for making sure that without um, breaching privacy, how do we share information with students that's meaningful? I have an answer for that, but I, I do like that yeah. you make it. <laughs> and it's a, it's a great suggestion, and it's also, we talk a lot about how our leadership team and our teachers use our data, which is really important and we're still working on it. Another layer of that is how do we bring this data actually to you? So even if we can't show your, your peers' data, do we ever sit down with you and look at your data? Exactly. So that you can say, huh, I wonder what this means. Yeah. Um, we, those are all things that we want to get better at. And it loops back into the justice and humanity. So yeah, how do we connect with those groups yeah. and that work that's happening in the building? Definitely. Um, so this slide is about suspension rates, and so there's a lot of overlap between the last two, two or three slides, actually, that are really all about not just engagement, but also just how are we in school. And, um, you know, what do we see? We have significant disproportionality here as well. Um, and suspension, the threshold is one, because suspension is pretty significant. If you're asked to leave the educational environment, one is out of the norm. So that's why the threshold, that's why we picked that. Um, and we see disproportionality in students with disabilities uh, in free and reduced lunch, um, and a pretty significant disproportionality in gender. So we, uh, male identifying students 
are suspended at a much higher rate than their representative proportion. Um, we also notice, and this is, a, I would say, a bright spot, um, yes, we have a small n, but we do not have statistically significant disproportionality when it comes to race. Um, again, all of this data is point in time. Part of why you're getting it is because you're going to start getting it year after year. So we would be looking for that to stay. Um, these are categories that nationwide there is disproportionality. Um, what questions does it raise? One of the things, many of actually what, the, what Kat and Julia had shared are also relevant here. I would also add to it, how do we engage with this data with the rest of our school population? Do our teachers look at this? Because some, some, when it comes to suspension, when it comes to how we interpret behavior, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of bias in there. And are we, is some of our disproportionality related to student engagement, but is it also related to how we interpret the behavior of certain identities? We don't know the answer to that. Part of how we find the answer to that is by putting this data in front of people. So that's one of the questions. What strikes us as significant is the disproportionality. Um, and then what are the implications? I sort of just reiterated that piece, but we need to look at this data more often. That's what, that's what this is about, is how do we do this on a more regular basis? And then this really points to a lot of what you hear us report on. When you did our uh, tours of the district, you heard about our social emotional learning systems of support. We know that we are in the process of identifying a more universal curriculum for social emotional learning. These are all pieces that are going to um, help us move this forward. Right. And then we look at our AP participation rate. Um, and I lost the number, it's 86, I think? Yes, yep. 86 students who were uh, in eight courses this year. Um, when you look at this data, what is significant is immediate, and that's the very top line, is that there are no students on an IEP taking an AP course, which leads to a very strong question of, are the students being directed away from those courses? Are they self-selecting not to take those courses for some reason? Um, are they not available to, the, uh, to a student on an IEP? Um, an IEP does not mean that you are not capable of doing this work. It means that you have a learning need that is met through specialized instruction. There are students on IEPs who could very easily take an AP course, um, and so we have a significant issue to address there. When it's zero, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yes? So who would be not referring or directing the student Course. Where would that not I, direction? Well, I would hope I, I would hope that I'm not saying that it would be a, an educator or a staff mm -hmm. member, um, but that would be that could be the people doing that. Whoop. Chris, I, I think, think that's the answer. next layer of questioning. So that's exactly yeah, why that's, we look at this data so that we can. Ask that question. We, <laughs> I would say socially. Socially, I mean the amount of people that are like. I'm not smart enough to take this class or like the the whole emotion around it like I don't know would you agree I was, I was gonna say something similar like obviously AP classes are difficult that's the point and I think also just like the way that some people talk about them like I am an AP chem and I just I don't always talk good about it but that's <laughs> to most of the kids in my class and like of course I love learning about it but like I think also it's like the social aspect and like like what Willow was saying, like they're hard classes and like it's it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it that can definitely discourage a lot of students yeah, and people from taking AP classes. And, yeah. oh, go ahead, well, no, no, go ahead. I was good. And it begs the question, are we are we communicating in either overt or or um, covert ways that a student is not capable of doing a class, mm -hmm. which is we have our, our AP program is actually AP for all, but the data does not show that. Yeah. And so um, we, would, we would support any student in being in an AP course. Um, so you see that the other significant piece of data that you see in there is male and female. And this is where you see the reversal of uh, what we just saw in all of our behavior and uh, attendance data. And we wonder, we wonder, are those things related in some ways? Um, and so, um, but we also saw that same uh, data difference in our algebra and um, algebra scores earlier 
um, that male and female were not performing um, the same in those areas as well. So these are definitely areas that we need to dig deeper in, build better systems for, and have a hard conversation about um, why we have a student group that's not participating at all. I was going to give like a less overt issue is they are not told about the classes or that they, they can be. take them. Yeah. I do have a question too because AP is also a subset of your full pop population. You know what I mean? So like when I'm looking at IEP versus non-IEP, this are these are all IEP of the demographic. But if we're looking at 86 participants, zero percent of those kids have an IEP. Right, right. But I mean, all the other data we've looked at has been a larger sub, a larger range. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. It is, it is a smaller group of kids, but that's also a, an issue for us to address as well. Um, we also recognize that AP isn't the only way towards um, towards college credits, which we have dual enrollment and we have. Um, early college, which we do not have those numbers for at this point in time. I just have a comment, something to think about. It's like, maybe one way you could encourage more students to take AP classes is having like an accessible tutoring program, or just mm -hmm. having more like student support in that. Because they are hard. <laughs> <laughs> what I would do for an advanced expo tutor right now is I search. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes with the, you know, like we want all the classes to be at the level of an AP class, yeah. and I sometimes question that we never really track our kids mm -hmm. and uh, we separate them, and we're not able to have those very you know, good conversations in a history class because you just have one group of students. Right. And, and I would also say that Willow brings up a very interesting comment that we would discuss more in the future, which is our universal design for learning talks about removing barriers and tutoring could be removal of those barriers for more kids to be able to do that. And so that's the kind of conversations that we need to continue. Well, Michelle has something. <laughs> <laughs> so the only other thing I would meet as a potential barrier um, is sometimes scheduling because if it's up yeah. against a class like an art class that mm -hmm. is only offered at that same time or furniture design class kids may choose to do those other classes versus taking an ap course at that right i mean it because ap is pretty much a one class one yeah. one one time one period a day and if it's up against some of those other things that kids want to do they may choose to do those instead they're also demanding classes so i would understand if someone has to get home and spend their time taking care of their little siblings while their parents work. So there are a ton of different like yeah. backgrounds to it, mm -hmm. but one thing that the school, because the school can help the school, <laughs> um, would be the suggestions that were put out already. See how much good conversation yeah. you have just by looking at a piece of data? I mean, that, that's the definition of why we look at this. It's, mm -hmm. it's exciting. Even yeah, if it's not showing us what we want. One thing that I is not on any of these slides, but one thing that Jeff is bringing up to me is like, what what can we do as a system to better support male identifying students in public education? Yeah. And like, what is does that start with like looking at our workforce demographics and like try to increase the number of males that they see and. Um, I don't know. That's just like something that's like just weighed on me really heavily. And I, you know, I have a husband who is a male teacher um, in an elementary school. And but but just thinking about that, how do we support and help? What? How do we look at our systems and our structures to better support young men, young male identifying students? I don't. I don't have all the answers to that. But that is a <laughs> wonder that's spinning around in my head. All right. So we're about to head into another um, section of our indicators. And again, this is the experience section. So eventually over time, this will be supplemented by real student and family voice through interviews. But for right now, this is our climate survey data. And I'll just head this off and then um, Alicia is gonna help us go through it. Um, uh, there is a link when you have the live version, not the printed version, there is a link for you to see all of the uh, results for the climate survey, it's an incredible amount of data. There's about 30 slides per section, too much for tonight. You will have access to it. So we're trying to give you a snapshot of what we've been doing with it um, and some things that have come out of that. Okay. 
Go for it. Uh, so our climate surveys go out, typically annually, it's been a few years since we've um, administered these, but they go out to three distinct groups. They go to families, they go to students, and they go to our staff. Um, we analyze the data both looking kind of holistically to look for any common trends, but we also disaggregate that by each of those subset groups and by question. Um, at East Montpelier, we use a data protocol to make meaning of this, so when we get our climate surveys back, our staff take quite a bit of time uh, to really dig through the data and sift through each of those. They look at what their peers have to say, what the families have to say, and, and students, really with the end goal being to respond to the, to the feedback that we're getting um, and ultimately to improve our school climate. So on this slide, it says families. Um, one example, after identifying that we want to investigate um, the effectiveness of our communication with parents, maybe we follow that up with a personal outreach to families, right? Maybe classroom teachers would connect with their families and say, hey, we learned through you, through this climate survey, that we are lacking in this area. What could we do to improve our communication? Me as principal may say, it, it looks like the question that was asked, you know, how does your principal is an effective communicator? I could do better in that area. I'd love to know more, right? So digging in really a little bit deeper. This next slide is just an example of feedback from families around the value that they believe that we put on social emotional learning and well-being as compared to our academics. And so one thing that we might say when we see this slide, a takeaway from this might be 70% of our families believe that we as a school value these equally. 30% of our families don't believe that there's a strong emphasis, um, as strong an emphasis on this area. And one thing we might want to further investigate or question um, is that we have 10 families in this district who took the survey um, who don't believe that this is ever true, that we don't value those, and that's something that we might want to really think about and pull into. This next slide looks at staff, um, and our staff spend time really reflecting on what they had put and what their colleagues um, think about our climate together. And this is an area that's of particular interest to me as a principal, because I want to know, just like a teacher wants to know what their class thinks, I, I want to know what uh, my staff think about our climate. Um, so in looking at the overall trends in this area to further investigate, maybe we'll open a conversation about the morale of our school, right? Or we'll want to talk a little bit more about our evaluations process. Um, staff surveys are really important for principals because they can be the thing that we set goals on for the next year. They are the feedback to me that tell me, this is what your staff think of how this school is running right now. Um, and it's it's super important. And it's also important, I think, for us as principals to, to come back to our staff and say, hey, we recognize and know that you're telling us this. We need to do something about it or celebrate. And I think this next slide is an area of celebration, right? This, this is a question, I feel welcome at our school, and if you look at um, those bars, that's an area that as a district we might want to just pause and celebrate and recognize. <laughs> yes. uh, this, the next two slides are around students. Um, student data is particularly important for teachers to focus on when thinking about their own classrooms. What's going well, what do we want to further investigate, and where are some um, areas that we need to improve on and that might be as a whole right we might look at that district wide we might look at that as a whole school and then teachers can dig in um, if you have more than one grade the way this climate survey works if you have more than one class in a grade i don't know that is me as the third grade teacher mm -hmm. right if i'm the only one and and they the students say i'm in kindergarten then i know this is right about me mm -hmm. um next before I flip the slide, it, I just was chuckling. So you all know how a wordle works, yeah, right? Yeah. It's the comments that are most, and these are all from oh. students, and I noticed how many kids <laughs> yeah. said, I don't know, IDK. <laughs> and Helen, right? Oh. <laughs> I, I find that a little amusing. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this slide is an example of something I did this spring with the East Mount Player staff. So we looked, we really dug into the student climate survey data. One, there's a question in there that says in that bar graph is um, the language that basically it asks students, do you have a trusted adult in this school? 
that you feel like you could go to. And the thing that was concerning to us in the climate survey data was that there were kids who said no, and that's a concern. The problem with the climate survey data is we had no idea who of those 200 kids that was. So I created another survey uh, in, in Google and sent it to every kindergartner through sixth grader in the school. The kindergarten teachers did this in an interview. Um, and basically asked the same question, yes or no, do you feel like you have a trusted adult, yes or no? If you answered yes, can you tell us, list who that adult or who those adults are? If you listed no, did you ever have one here in the past, yes or no? Um, and if you did have a trusted adult, at some point, who was it? Um, and then we came together, classroom teachers got this data, and they looked at it. Um, the other thing we did, that yellow chart paper, I gave my staff the same survey. So I had a chart paper with every grade level on it and the little life touch pictures of every child in that grade and gave each of my staff members five blue dots. And I had them put their names on it and they went up and put the dots next to any students that they felt they had a connection with who did they, they felt they could be or were a trusted adult. Mm -hmm. So then we went back, right? I have adult data, <coughs> student data, and we compared the two to say, what are the kids saying? What do we as adults think? And we kind of cross-checked those. And there were some kids who were like, oh, they said you and you said them, and that's a great match. Like, we're on the same page. There were some where the adults said, yeah, I feel like I'm the go-to person, and the child had no trusted adults, right? Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect there. Um, there were some, unfortunately, who they said no, and there were no stickies. There were no dots next to that child. Those were the students that we identified um, this past week as we're setting goals for, right? We need to make connections with and make sure that, that, we, that they feel like they have and that we all feel like we can connect with. That was a really powerful takeaway. Some of the, um, like, no, I don't have a trusted adult, but I did, and it was my preschool teacher, and he retired, right? Like, it was really helpful, like, oh, you're in second grade, and you haven't felt like you've had an adult for the past three years, but you did. How can we make sure you have that? Like, so it was super helpful data, but this is just one way that, like Megan said, you could, we spent hours pouring through just these Montpelier's data. This was one question, and it took us several weeks. But I do feel like as a staff, we can confidently say we know who those kids are, and we have a plan to make it better for them. And that really is the goal of, of the climate survey. Thanks, yep. Um, I have a multi-part question. Number one, where do I find the link for all these? Well, you can see when you see it live. See where it says link to full. Well, results. but I mean, I don't. But but where's this gonna be? In, on the website. The it's gonna be, but it's not yet, right? No, because okay. it's board, okay. It's a board packet. That's Part two. Um, in the full data, do we see it by school? The this data is district wide data. Yes. We do not like we post don't publicly the school-based data because of our end size, frankly. Right. The the these folks see it. Yes. Right, and that's true of the outcome data as well. Yeah. And that makes sense generally. Um, I'm curious what since our we've been having these conversations about um, reconfiguration. I think that there is more incentive potentially when we think about potentially closing buildings and moving administrators and teachers and trusted adults to knowing identifying the differences maybe strengths and weaknesses in culture at the various buildings um, and you know Chani had mentioned how are the Doty students performing you know are, are the kids on IEPs at one school doing great like how how can we make that district wide. I know you guys are looking at it school level, but I just worry like as board members tasked with overseeing this um, reconfiguration, if we aren't aware of those strengths and weaknesses, it makes it a little yeah. challenging. One of the things that the board can look at is, is the next layer down of what did you find? What were the themes when you compared yourselves building by building? And what what are your thoughts about that and what are you doing about it? So Alicia just gave one school-based example about how they do it. There are more examples of what, what we do and it can be, and 
I think this goes back to kind of long term, what does the board and how does the board want to engage with this data? Tonight is meant to be a snapshot. The question you asked might be, but I, th I think it would be important to do a dive to comparisons. Then administration would say, okay, how do we present this, in a data, present this data in a way that answers the question you're asking and doesn't reveal something it shouldn't? And I think there is a way to do that. So I think it's a good question. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. For the climate survey data, one of the one of the really high level recommendations that we know, so it's not the first time climate surveys have been used, it is the first time a universal consistent one across all of our buildings has been used. And um, you, should all, you should know, actually you'll know this if you filled it out as a parent, there was a question about how is the, this slide is not in your packet. No. It was a very late addition, <laughs> and I did not want to, I'm like, why is everybody roughly? <laughs> I, I, I did not want to waste paper and have Melissa reprint. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, not in your packet. It will be. It, it is, is going to be on the website, but um, it's the first time we've distributed it universally. We got a ton of feedback actually just about the survey itself which was really, really helpful. So people had thoughts about, like, there's not enough space to write comments, and um, I, this question is not worded poorly. You Really helpful. So we will be revising um, things based on that. We also know that we want to create some more consistency in how we distribute and manage the survey, because there's variability in our response rates in each category. Um, some schools have really strong response rates in one area and not in another, so, so sort of everywhere. So we want to be more consistent about that. And then the other thing is we should have a little bit more of a district-wide process for how our staff will engage with our climate survey data. Um, this is a snapshot example, a lot to learn, and everybody looks at it differently. We should have some consistency in um, how, how, so that every staff person can say, oh yeah, I engage with the Survey. So we know that those are some recommendations coming out of this piece of data. What would that consistency look like? Well, so for example, Alicia has used several faculty meetings in a row to do a data protocol. We might say everyone will do a data protocol with their faculty on one piece of data. Right now we don't have any common expectation in how we did that. We think we should develop one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Implementation, it's the last section, and it'll be a little bit faster. Um, so there's two slides here uh, in the spirit of reminding folks this is not an exhaustive everything we have ever done. It's also really not representative of, we have a lot of equity champions in this district doing really amazing work as individuals. We have staff presenting at conferences, we have students presenting at conferences. This is not a laundry list of all those, those things. This is support, so, this slide is a report out of the district-wide, district-organized work for this year. Um, so we continue, Shelley continues to teach a graduate course. Um, are there board members in it this year? Thank you. And there's almost always board members, um, stay and staff, and some staff take it multiple years. Um, we, our leadership team, this, uh, this equity work not just in design teams, although it's written as design teams, it's really foundational to our work. Um, we had a district-wide January in-service day that was focused on humanity and justice. Um, principals led a protocol on using an equity lens to analyze data. We continue to have a humanity and justice coalition that meets monthly. Um, they've provided a lot of input this year on policies. Um, they have connected our work with student groups and um, families of color affinity groups, so it's been a nice opportunity to, to kind of connect that work. Um, our policy committee should commend itself on doing some pretty important equity work in the past two years. Obviously last year is when you pass the overall policy, but this year's work is on defining an education philosophy and really making an affirmative statement that we are going to teach these, uh, these things. And it may not, end up being called teaching about controversial issues, but we are, um, again, affirmatively saying we will teach about controversial things and here's how we do it. So those are some pretty important policy pieces. Uh, there is a coaching for equity book group discussion. Um, so again, these are the district-wide led things and there's probably missing things on this. We do know, though, 
we have so much good work happening in this district, but as Stephen talked about in our journey that started very grassroots, we are at the point where we have to match that grassroots with some expectation. So we do think that moving forward, we need a little bit more of a structured work plan to say whether that is a everyone will eventually move their way through this professional learning or things like that. But we need a little bit more structure around our work. That's one of the things we think we should work on. And then this is also not meant to be exhaustive, but it is a little bit of a summary of specifically the work of our equity scholar in our schools. Um, the document that I pulled this from is much longer with more examples and more detail, and I was trying to make it fit on one slide. Um, but in a very uh, individualized way, our equity scholar has been working hard to make, their, make her way around the district. Um, the equity scholar position originated here at U32, so for a long time this is where it spent most, um, this is where Shelly spent most of her time, and we've um, been really careful to try to expand that. Um, and we want to do that, similar to this recommendation about having a more structured work plan, we also want a more structured way of, of what's the expectation around the equity scholar work in all of our schools. Um, and let's make that a little bit more consistent. And we also, um, and, and Berlin has established um, this structure, and I think it's really helpful. We think that each of our schools really needs some sort of school-based and it says equity committee structure, everybody hates the word committee, but you need a group of people in each building that's gonna hold the work and lead the work and champion the work, and not just individuals. So we do think that that is an important structure to be expanded across the system. That would allow that they may be a group that looks at the building level equity data that we just talked about and says, here's the things that we need to work on in our school, or we need to circle up around some uh, microaggression issues that have happened, or frankly, racial incidents bigger than microaggressions, and we need to circle up around that. We need groups, we need an identified structure to do that, we think. So that's one of our recommendations coming out of this. And more globally, and I was hoping that by the time we got to this part, you would have already heard these, and I think that that might be true. We've talked a lot about the best way for you to engage in this is actually to be able to go deeper, which you can do if we do this as part of our monitoring cycle. Um, we need to look at this data more across the district um, and do that really thoughtfully, uh, both as a leadership team but also for our staff. How do they engage with this data? And as you know, we have specific goals in our strategic plan, and the strategic plan is a very high-level document. The leadership team needs to, will be, that's part of their, um, our retreat work, is to identify action steps for next year related to those goals. And with that, this is how you would typically, as a board, you would ask yourselves these same questions. Laura, I'll let you decide what the bandwidth is for that. I know we've yeah, been talking so about that. I want to do just a, a quick time check with the board before we like completely, yeah. you know, like, so the, uh, yeah, so we, we have our uh, our students' uh, reports, and we still have some of the reports with board, and we have the policy and finance committee and an executive committee after. So I'm not saying that this is not important because this was like a really, really good presentation, but I'm wondering if uh, it, we can use some of the questions, but I'm wondering if we could also think about, when you're asking the question, think about it in uh, that we are, we've been working to sort of baking this uh, um, into our ed quality, so monitoring through ed quality, and we have done some work in that. And if the board, if there's a specific area where we want to lean in, which we should, uh, we should uh, we should build it into our work plan, and we're going to have a retreat to you know to build our work plan. So I just want to put that there. But I, instead of doing all of the questions, so if each of you could answer one of the questions so that we don't, but does that make sense? Yeah, and I was gonna suggest when we finish this protocol that we do a small break. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it.
Okay, so is there somebody that wants to say, what do you see? I just don't think that we have time for everybody. Is that, what do you see? Is there somebody that? So what I see is the need to have this embedded in our work plan and to review it. It's a lot of great information and it's not a one and done. So it's, what I see is that I need time to process and then have the opportunity to come back. Thank you, Diane. Anybody else? Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I I agree with that, and also just want to say thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm. This is really helpful to see, and I know you've done a ton more work behind even this, and it's just really important, and I appreciate it. And then one small thing is when you post this to the website. If you guys could give just a one sentence, like one more sentence on what these colors mean. I think I think we needed people up there describing what these graphs were saying. Mm -hmm. And so if this is just going out to the community, I, I don't think it's accessible. What we would have to do, are. it'll go up on the website as the document that was presented here tonight. Okay. We would need to have a different version of it, but we can work on that. Okay. 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 And that we just heard about a question that the presentation raises for you. Is there any other questions that this presentation raised for you? Seth? I, I would just like to know about sort of like you know, how accurate we still think free and reduced lunches and are there other mm -hmm. other other indicators we use for economic disadvantage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel? I, I'm curious about the um, like who drives this for the district, like it, um, I heard a lot of like school leader voice here, but I, there's also discussion about like how we standardize and how we adopt best practices and mm -hmm. and stretch them across the district. And I'm just curious, like, does that all rest on a single person in the central office, or what's yeah? How, what does that process look like? Yeah, I can share an answer to that question, and also, frankly, just my perspective on it. Um, it really is held by everyone. I could say it's ultimately held by the superintendent, right? But I believe that it is actually guided and driven by the entire team. And the part of this that is my perspective is when it only sits with one person, so when you have an equity coordinator, then the idea is that it's finished, that it's this person holds all the work and we're good. And it tends not to have as much effect. So. Um, I would say it doesn't sit with one single person, except for the person who is ultimately responsible to all of you. Um, it's why it's embedded in our strategic plan. If, as we move forward, it's going to be embedded in our teacher evaluation system, it is embedded into the evaluation system we use as a leadership team, um, and that's kind of how it's all held. The, le the leadership team of which team are you referring to? The, the collective team. leadership team is principals and central office okay. administrators. Thanks. Yep. And I, was, and I will add to that 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 includes us, right? Mm -hmm. So we, by us being wanting to monitor and by us, you know, wanting to be participate in this work, so it's, it's everybody. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I saw your hand is up. Yeah, I had the same um, uh, free reduced lunch question, but then I, I have a question, a question about the significant bullet. If I can jump to there, yeah. So um, my. It would be helpful to know what is significant to have the N on the slide. So, like numbers, specifically the suspensions one, would be helpful to see like how many we dealing, how many we dealing with, to know if if the little percent differences between some of the categories were significant. Um, and then, just to that point, it certainly looked like the gender difference was was significant uh, across the board. And then, um, and that's something that's certainly something to think about. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Yeah. What are the implications for our work? Percent. Um, so Megan kept pointing to me every time she talked about embedding this into the um, work of the board. I don't know if anybody noticed. Um, <laughs> we have in Ed Quality Committee um, been talking about how these will start getting baked into the Ed Quality Committee's work of the review cycle. And so I have notes on like three different places. Um, lots of notes on are we going to add reports to the board 
like are we going to how are we going to do this work do we add this into our rotation of like we have certain student learning outcomes that we review does this get added in to our review cycle is it another annual report that we report out to the board so i think it's something ed quality gets to tackle quite a bit and then report back to the board and you guys have had one report from us so far but it, we would do it in the same fashion you guys we report out you guys have the information and then you tell us if it's what you need or if you need more or something different. i'm excited about that yeah. okay oh, daniel this is my second bullet and I'm saying something, it's but, okay um <laughs> I, I'm interested, I'm excited also, I'm excited to sort of hear the story, like there were a couple references to like mm -hmm. the questions that this raises for, for principals and I'm excited to hear the stories of like where we identify the feedback loops and like the points of intervention to, to sort of change these outcomes. That sounds like a really exciting piece of this, which this feels very baseline-y, but that's like the next step and something we can all get excited about. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for the for all of this work. We're really excited to having a benchmark and being able to do this again next year. And like Celia was saying, maybe and compare apples to apples too, and looking at that alignment across the district is something we're excited about. And, and that you guys are excited makes us so looking forward to doing this through our Ed Quality Committee and putting it in our work plan. Uh, let's get a five-minute break before we dive into We're live. We're going to try to continue so that we can get done well. Yeah, probably it's going to be dark, but let's get going. Student report. Thank you, students, for being with us. Who's going to get started? Uh, we'll start. We'll start with this one because the photos will be shared. <laughs> um, we had prom this weekend. It was so much fun. So this is like an odd angle, but it's majority of our senior class who attended prom. Um, it's super cute. <laughs> uh, but it was great. People looked amazing. People were excited. The music was okay. <laughs> um, I don't think I left the dance floor once. Uh, and the most important thing is everyone woke up the next morning and everyone was safe and was okay. And I think a lot of, I know my parents were thinking about that, but I think every, like our school can say that and it's the second year we can say that. So that's something to be super appreciative of. Um, next photo. <laughs> So here's a better one of the whole senior class. <laughs> Sorry, Linnea. <laughs> um, and then you can go to the next yeah. one. <laughs> and then I was just sent this third photo, and I just had to share this one. <laughs> and Stephen is the best chaperone. <laughs> there were other people who did that too. Okay. When I was gonna run through hers and then I went through mine. <laughs> All right. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is sports. Um, as probably most of you know, it's been extremely hot these Ooh. past few days. Um, we've had cancellations. We've had like delays. Um, our game today was very hot, but um, the sports teams are doing well. I believe they were track meet yesterday or Monday. Um, there was a girls across game today, a boys across game in Montpelier that got canceled, unfortunately. Um, there was a tennis match today. Um, and everyone's doing really good. Um, we're getting we're getting kind of close to championship seasons, um, which is exciting, but also a little nerve wracking. But um, we still got time, so. Okay. So the next one is the eighth grade DC trip which um, I'm a little salty about. I didn't get to go to that, but... Me neither. Sure that would be great. Um, <laughs> Super happy for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, we believe it's this weekend, um, so that's going to be awesome. We got a new principal. Woo! Yay! Yay! Awesome. Burned. 
Um, and then another thing that's happening is the Peru trip next year. Um, so that's for, I believe, sophomores and juniors, uh, seniors, which is really exciting. Um, we put down the closets a few days ago, and it's going to be great. And then the last thing is AP exams. Um, they happened. There's a bio exam tomorrow, um, which is unfortunate, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't take AP bio. Thank gosh. Um, so yeah. So our AP bio test, not our, I'm also not an AP bio, <laughs> luckily. Um, it, we had a walk down the other day, which was really strange because everyone kind of followed like themselves into their classroom and everyone was just like, kind of confused. Um, there's a positive and a negative about that. Well, the positive is every single person knew what to do. We Locked the door, shut the lights off, um, sat in sat in the corner, was quiet, and also the negative is we knew exactly what to do. It's it's so unfortunate that we <laughs> we don't have to ask questions. We know exactly where to go, what to do, in case there's an intruder in the school. So that was a weird a weird feeling to just be able to sit silent and know what to do. But luckily, thankfully, it was a false alarm, some some wiring mishap. We don't really know, but it was it wasn't something, which was so great. Which was great. Um I feel like I should wait for that one. Yeah, um, maybe move that one. Maybe. The seniors, I'm gonna talk about the senior class for a second. We have been plotting for our prank. And that's going to be coming up soon. Um, we also have our senior trip coming up. We're going up down to Boston. And we're going to the aquarium. We're going to watch the baseball game. We're going to Six Flags. And then we're coming back. Um, right in time. Yep, right in time for graduation. Everyone's counting down the days. We are so ready to get to summer. Um, something that's been super exciting and super stressful is we are playing a game called Senior A Splashin! <laughs> um, <laughs> um, where you get a target and your job is to get your target out and how you do is you squirt them with water. So if you are in the building and you see seniors chasing each other in the parking lot with a water stuff water, uh, water squirters <laughs> then don't be alarmed it's the game and we i'm still in it thankfully um, are your floaties oh and your the floaties? first first week you had to wear floaties in public if oh. you didn't want to get out in public so i i carried on a life vest my entire <laughs> my entire week um but now floaties are gone so anyone is free game and the only rule is you can't get out inside the school. So everyone's really eager to get inside. So that's a problem. <laughs> um, and then finally, just it's it is coming down to the last couple weeks, but the school board has been a great opportunity for me to learn about what happens behind the scenes. And I really appreciate everyone who's been here taking time out of their day, out of their work, to doing something extra and taking the opportunity you have a free time to do it something more so I do appreciate it and then Steven's leaving and it's such a sad moment Steven's my best friend <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really appreciate all of you being here and Anaya and whoever it may be next year is going to do great so thank you and that is our student report and we are going to go because we have so much more. <laughs> and thank you Will yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye guys. Well, thank you yeah. both of you and thank you well. We will see you at the award ceremony. Yes. And we'll move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll all stare at you. Yeah. <laughs> real quiet. <laughs> okay, we have the principal report and Typically, for principal's report, it's just whether or not you all have questions. We have a dwindling group of them. So, <laughs> it's Kat. 
Oh wait, go ahead. Ask me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> How do you realize this? <laughs> Um, in terms of the Colt Report, Suzanne, I don't know if you want to just kind of highlight the movement and therefore now fully staffness of the central office, which is exciting. Full finance team. <laughs> As of Monday the 20th, so Shannon Knowles was the admin assistant at Romney. She has taken Tom Hamlin's accounts payable accountant position because Tom took uh, Penny's financial accountant position when Penny Andrews took the payroll specialist position that Holly Poulin had, and Holly Poulin took Carla Messier's benefit specialist position, and I'm not lying about any of that. It was like so much movement. The dominoes fell, but I feel really, really good about the cross training that's occurring because of this. Uh, Penny now has done three different jobs, and um, I feel really confident that if Tom needs to take a vacation, which he's taking next week, Penny can handle accounts payable. Well, of course, now it'll be Shannon. <laughs> and Tom will back Shannon up. So there's good things there. Uh, and the strength in this team is really, really good. And we're excited about um, what it's doing with HR and uh, making it so that a the HR director can start to support the, the buildings more. So uh, that kind of paused when Carla gave her notice <coughs> to circle around the wagons. So, but. Yay, I'm full. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Great. So, welcome to all of them. We have new jobs. <laughs> Unless folks have questions. Do you guys have any specific questions? Okay, we really appreciated the highlights of the procedures and everything that was in there. <coughs> We're going to move now into uh, just fine. Into the Central Vermont, uh, Central Vermont Career Center, I added a page that Megan had also added to her to her news, oh, news right. to her yeah. newsletter. And just that we just had a meeting yesterday. That is the only committee that I promised Jody that I would stay in, and is the facility committee for the Career Center, which is a separate committee with members of the board, but there's a separate committee. And uh, it, this is a great place where you can go and, uh, you know, we're trying to gather some input. We just had a meeting uh, mostly about sites. Uh, we've been looking at sites. They looked over 100 sites, narrow it down to 33 sites, and now we're trying to narrow that criteria down so that the sites are uh, centrally located. And when I mean sites, we're hoping, and I think we shared this a few months ago, that uh, our goal is to have a new career center. By, you know, some time in the future, so break ground, you know, soonish, but, you know, have one by 2029, 2030. Uh, uh, but ideally, that will serve uh, our six sending districts, and uh, I think that is the only update I have. Joshua had, you know, it's leaving, so he hasn't been able to go. He's in the middle of packing and <coughs> leaving pretty soon. So that's all I have for the career center. So take a little time to, to go into this uh, so that we can gather your, your input. And there's a lot of the why in that information. Um, OK, let's move into our, if I have it right, we're moving right into our finance committee. And I'm looking for a motion to award the Berlin Walking Cooler increase a replacement. Do I have a motion? Thank you. I move that the board approve awarding the Berlin Walking Cooler and Freezer Replacement Project contract to VAG Company in an amount not to exceed fifty-seven thousand fifty-six dollars. Thank you. Second by I'm gonna give it to Keely. Is that okay to do? Okay. Any discussion, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, and now, on page 25, we're looking for a motion to accept the annual fiscal management questionnaire. Daniel. Uh, I move that the board accept the annual financial management questionnaire prepared by the business administrator and included in the board package. Second. Thank you, Zach. Any questions from board members? Hearing none, eh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. We have a couple of new board members today, and I should have clarified. So we have committees. We have committees, and this subcommittee does 
helps advance the work of the board. So the finance committee has reviewed this and they make recommendations to the board. So it's not completely gone unchecked, right? So just for you guys to know. All right, 6.3, authorize the superintendent to sign contracts and accept grants. Do I have a motion? A motion to authorize the superintendent to sign all contracts and accept grants on behalf of Washington Sunday. For the fifth, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's FY twenty four twenty five. Second. Thank you, Michelle. Second by Amelia. Yeah. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I didn't even give you a chance to ask questions. So hopefully that was okay. I didn't see any. Okay. And let's move to six point four. Blanket authorization for board warrants and checks. Orders. And the board authorized the blanket authorization for board warrants, including the packet, effective through fiscal year 24 25. Thank you, Zach. Second. Thank you, Michelle. That was in the purple folder, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There are four <laughs> things to sign in that purple folder because. Yeah, yes. Because some people. Yeah, there's there's one page, and I'll go out when we go into executive session. There's one page that is missing two signatures. But okay. We need at least eight signatures. But okay, all, any questions about this? No. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, approve the capital improvement project plan and multi year budget. I have a motion. I move that the board. Approve the revised five-year capital improvement plan budget and timeline and authorize the use of capital reserve funds not to exceed fifty thousand dollars to develop the necessary scope and budget for the FY 25-26 approved capital improvement projects. Thank you, Daniel. Second by Ursula. Yes, please. All right. All those uh, any questions? <clears throat> any discussion? Okay, I just want to thank everybody involved. Suzanne, thank you. Please thank Bill and Chris, too, for all this work. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Uh, and this is the meat of this. So we uh, an update from our configuration committee. Uh, the configuration uh, committee met before uh, the board meeting, as, as you all know. I'm going to move back to to that agenda because I made my notes there, sorry. Uh, I think it is here. And and we uh, we started that meeting, and I didn't do this at the beginning of this meeting, but uh, listening to the comments, maybe I should have uh, done a little bit of that. We started that meeting by just uh, reminding uh, ourselves that there are many emotions involved with the future of our schools, and recognizing that is a complex Thing that we're trying to do but that by that you know we're hopeful that by working together and grounding ourselves in the visions and in the vision and the core beliefs eh, we'll be able to look at the configuration options and allow our class sizes to meet education quality standards and provide rich instruction while maintaining full-time nursing counseling reducing part-time positions and expanding enrichment opportunities across the district including you know eh, language music art uh, while also ensuring that our taxpayers can afford to live in our communities. Uh, and we, we recognize and made a lot of commitments at this meeting that we have a lot of work uh, to do, but we have a responsibility to bring oxygen into the system. And we had some volunteers, so we are um, going to forget right now exactly everybody. So Chris, McKaylin, and Daniel are going to spearhead our community forums. Zach um, uh, and I are going to work on frequently asked questions and have to go to a different document. And I'll be there with you one second. Chris is also focusing Listen. on select boards. Select board, yeah. So basically we work, we have a document, and that's the third bullet, we have a document that is our communications plan. And what we worked really hard was in that timeline too. So a commitment that we have three phases without completely focusing too much on the phases, but the first phase is community engagement until the end of July. The first part of that community engagement is gonna take part from now until June. 
and there's a second phase within that first phase without making it totally. That is also forums, but we're, as we started to narrow down our, our, our options, our administrative team would also be able to have more accurate numbers of where we're trying to get to. And by, uh, we're still all committed that by September 18, we will be making a decision as a board uh, on what the article of agreement that we will be putting out to vote is. Um, I missed anything, configuration and finance committee members. But the goal was to really create a lot of community engagement and dialogue um, because we're pretty um, impressed by the dialogue we had on May 1st with a lot of us going to the communities and having back and forth as opposed to speaking at. It was, a di it was true dialogue and, and it was energizing. So that is the hope mm -hmm. with all these different forms that we'll get that type of feedback and engagement. I'm not worry about maybe saying the wrong thing, um, but um, you know, just so that's that is the goal to, to really have that so that the community can get a lot of information and we can hear from our community members as to what their concerns and what they're looking for. And as we and we made a commitment, and this is to run by the board too, but we made a commitment that by the time we get into phase two and three, we would uh, we would hire a consultant as a board to help us, uh, Jeannie, who was helping us also hopefully uh, through the strategic planning process to be able to you know, uh, use her expertise to make sure that we can advance that work in a way that is uh, uh, that we can best engage our community and uh, uh, the community uh, that we can advance the work basically uh, but so we have a lot of work to do but we have answered the questions that we needed to advance that and we gave Clear, uh, we were able to provide a little bit more clarity to our administrators, and, and we we're thankful for Megan to be willing to put all of that chicken scratch that we gave her today into populating that that uh, table that allows us to have a communication plan without keeping us in those boundaries. And, and I think that's it. Anything that the board, mm -hmm. is the board as a whole, because I know some of you were not able to, you know, are not part of the smaller finance configuration committee. It, no? I would say a critical piece, especially for those who are not around the table or who might be new, or is it where, so that we know where to access documents, find documents, to sign up to be at the uh, forums and to know clearly mm -hmm. what, what, our, mm -hmm. what our steps are. Yes. You know, because I forget where, which, where is that link? You know what I mean. So just as long as we're, uh, we we have a clear place that we like or something. And we've been talking about having a button on the phone. I, you just went where I was going to go. We have a section on the website that has been held and used for budget for this time, but we can repurpose that so that it's on the main page and have it just, it's the configuration study. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm, it's not the budget one we're replacing, yes, it's, it's the, the strategic, strategic plan, yeah. which will still be linked on the website, but it, but it will allow the configuration mm -hmm. study to be um, linked directly there. Yeah. Oh, Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, I think, that, I think that it's really important for us to be really creative about reaching different parts of our community that might not be available for one of these community, these information sessions, but are really, really concerned about what the future might be. Um, and I think engaging them as soon as possible and, and continuously, I think is really important. So I don't, I don't have the solution really, but like we need to be really cognizant of, of how people get information and how people can be in, engaged in, in this process. And, and we've got to, and we've got to find them now and find them, find them quickly so that we can, so they don't be surprised by whatever, whatever next year brings. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, that's a good point. And the committee had some discussion around around that. And it, you just reminded me that it would be good, especially for the people that are spearheading the forums, to bring together our community mapping exercise that we did, because that document has a lot of the information already where people gather. And yeah, I'm happy. Especially July 4th activities coming up in a lot of our communities. Yeah. So, but thank you. And then, yeah, and also what you're saying, it reminds us that we talked a lot about focus groups and that's a, a good place for bringing them together. Okay. Is everybody okay So that? Any other guys? I don't wanna limit this discussion, it's important. 
But yeah, I'm, I'm hearing thumbs up from Michaela. So if she says it's okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take that as you did a good job. So okay, first reading for the policy committee. This reading of F45, uh, Megan had sent the revised yeah, I can policy. And so go ahead, Megan. Um, I did not have a chance to put a memo together, but this is relatively simple. Um, policy was doing its annual review and Suzanne had actually given this suggestion. Our fundraising policy, the way that it is currently written, um, with really good reason, uh, when money, when things are purchased with money that is fundraised for, they're the property of the school district so that it benefits the school, but the fundraising policy applies to, for example, the boosters or the PTO, and sometimes those entities want to buy something and give it to students. Mm -hmm. Boosters is a good example of that, but PTO does as well, and technically our policy precluded that. So the two mm -hmm. suggestions in here, um, and there were different suggestions. The policy committee talked through some different ways of writing it. They didn't actually want to take away all the protections and sort of say that anything can be given to for non-school purposes, but they wanted to be really specific that if we're buying sweatshirts for the team that just won the state championship, we should be able to give those to students. So that is a highlight of the changes being offered for your consideration today. Miss anything? It, it, it really was kind of a narrow, narrow purpose of not being with the, with the practice is now, yeah, yes, to be not being frankly. policy. <laughs> yeah. So kind of aligning the policy with practice, yeah. but without giving up too much. And because we have yes. new That's board members, uh, because we have new board members, Chris, would you mind uh, telling them why is this the first reading and what we do next? Okay, so um, go through the first reading and then come solicit comments from any of the board members. And then we'll go back and, and if we have comments, revise it again if necessary, and then come back to the second meeting and then do a, uh, a vote for the final version. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Laura. I'm curious if this affected like teams who were like fundraising so they could buy themselves apparel. Was that the same situation that technically yeah. the policy precluded it? Yes. And now it does not. If yeah. you adapt this. Really yes, yes, if we adopt. taking back their uh, <laughs> jackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do that. I want to see teachers wearing them. Uh, I would. <laughs> We just recycle and the next year has to win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's incentive. motivation. I got it. Okay. You get this old jacket. <laughs> <laughs> name off of this. So were there any concerns or any input for the policy committee from board members? Does the policy number match? Does the VSBA have one? We checked, checked it and, and we, and we, I didn't and we said sorry. Ursula is going to make us check. Yeah. <laughs> I did not get a chance to look today. So yeah. oh, we said we knew I, we would. I, so we I planned to and then things came up. I, I did check <laughs> until today because I was exactly that question. She knew I was busy. Yeah, that's what you said. That's, there okay. we go. No, I'm happy. So, okay, so then we can move into personnel. We have a lot of exciting Yes, and speaking of personnel, personnel, this is the time of year when it changes a lot. So I have a new sheet, um, which is exciting. And while I'm passing it out, we don't normally, because folks don't have to come here, but for anyone who doesn't have a face to a name, our two administrator recommendations are here. So Becca. U32 principal and Julia, who is a familiar face, but will be, is being nominated to you for the director of special ed for the district. And I just wanted to acknowledge that they've been here all night. Okay, Daniel is ready. I was just going to ask before we get into this if there was any kind of update about um, return of contracts and things like that. Going with yes, well, it's because of, frankly, the fact that we issued RIFs, it's, um, we paid a lot of attention. So um, contracts, most depend, give or take, because they have 30 days from when they received it, but that was round about May, or sorry, yes, May 12th. Um, we had contracts that solidifies who's leaving and who is not, and that allowed us to issue recall notices so that is what has actually just been processed is a number of recall notices we have been able to recall a number of the staff who were reduced and then any staff because the budget passed any staff that received a contingency RIF received 
is receiving their Louise. contract. It's being processed. Thank you. We're they went out there. today. We're or yes. Thank you. So that's the update. So I'm looking for a motion because I want to give a chance for the ones that are here to introduce themselves. So I'm looking for a motion for the new hires first. Okay. Ursula. Oh. Well, you were the only one looking at me directly, so. <laughs> Before I start, Rebecca, can I ask you to help me pronounce your name? Your last name. <laughs> I noticed that nobody had gone there yet. <laughs> That's okay. So I'm maybe we'll have you here. introduce yourself first. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I'm Becca Tatisha. Um, I go by Becca. You'll hear that. You'll see Rebecca in writing everywhere. I just clarified that to look at folks, but my preferred name. And you never have to say my last name after this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pronounced Tatisha. Yeah. So right. Tatisha? Tatisha. 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 I move that we accept the new hire nominations for the 24 25 school year of Rebecca Tatisha, U32 principal, Julia Pritchard, student services director. Jennifer Pelletier, Substance Abuse Counselor, Student Services U32. Liza Semler, Community and Work-Based Learning Coordinator U32. Scott Benaroff, Middle School Science Teacher U32. Nicole Minkin, School Nurse U32. Kathy Ellie, Literacy Interventionist East Montpelier. And Linda Fazy, School Nurse at Doty. Lydia. 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 What did I say? Linda. Did not mean to do that and I apologize. <laughs> second. All right. So second by Mich who's going to win that one? Michelle. Michelle. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you for all the work. That was a lot of work for all of you guys. And I want to welcome, welcome both of you here. And Julia, you want to introduce yourself for people that I, most people know you, but there's some that don't. So. I'm happy to. My name is Julia Pritchard, and I have served as the Director of Social Services here at U32, just finishing up my fourth year, and I couldn't be happier to be making this move and delighted for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Kim? Yep. So welcome, both of you. We are super excited to have you join our team. And don't feel like you have to stay. It's <laughs> really exciting now. <laughs> okay, so resignations. I move to accept the resignations of Stephen Dellinger Pate, U32 principal, Christine McGrath, classroom teacher, Romney Memorial, Samantha Mishkin, classroom teacher, East Montpelier, Bethany Parker, interventionist at East Montpelier, Christina Pollard, classroom teacher, Doty, Amy Jo Young, Liber Library Media, Berlin, and Benton Laro, interventionist at Doty. Second. Second by Daniel. Any. Uh, uh, yeah. Other than Stephen, who we expected, were these unexpected resignations? Um, some of both. Some people moving on to other jobs, some people moving on to different jobs, some people retiring. And um, I, I, part of the process is exit interviews, correct? We don't have procedures around that and have all talked about wanting to develop that. So I would say that there is nothing scheduled or formal, but it is a desire to create that structure. And we always would grant them on request. Mm -hmm. I've done, I think, two since I've been here. Um, but we, right now, at the moment, don't have a formal way of doing that. But it's definitely something that we're I just think given the in. process we just went through, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of these people have been here a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And also having a collective sense of the number of years. Um, and that just, just informational as a board would be, would be very helpful. Um, and I think we just add on, you know, with great appreciation. Mm -hmm. and. And um, good luck, and and from myself personally, I'm sorry we had to be in that position. Like mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be. But for me, second, thanks. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I, I will agree with this. I don't know, I'll, you know, personally all of them, but there's a couple of people here, especially with that partner that has been in the system mm -hmm. for a really, really long time, and. Uh, you know, just appreciation for all of them, really, and, mm -hmm. you know, you're transitioning, but, you know, you've been here for, you know, like, 10 years now? 10 years. 10 years. It's just, it's, 
matches my kids as they just keep, so the only reason I know. It, so, yeah. So with that, let's uh, have a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Who seconded that? Sorry. Uh, Daniel. Ursula moved it, and Daniel seconded it. Chris tried to confuse you there by saying the second. <laughs> that didn't work. But, but we, no, I had you checked. So it did not work. Uh, extended, no. No, 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 we're on change in position. <laughs> I move that we accept the change in position for the 24-25 school year for Tyler Smith, Berlin interventionist slash coach tra transitioning to Berlin school-wide social and emotional learning behavior coordinator. Thank you, Ursula. Second. Second by Michelle. Any questions or discussion? Before you vote on oh. that, can I just... Along with Tyler's nomination, is also a request for a leave of absence for Tyler, yeah. and I just want to make sure you act, take action on that because they kind of go together. Yeah. So, so, so just add, add to your it, motion. I'm going to add to my motion so that we accept his request, request yeah. for a leave of absence in order to take this position. Okay. And then, Michelle, are you okay with that friendly uh, amendment? Okay. Yes. And okay, so you're so not that. leaving the one position. To, to do this other position. Yes, but he's taking a, a leave of absence. So that if it doesn't work out or whatever, yep. he has that yeah. it's like Or if we don't have the funding. Sure yeah. Yeah. yeah, or if we don't have the funding next year, it keeps him mm -hmm. safety. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is pretty exciting for, for yeah, to get this position yeah. and for Tyler to be willing to take yeah. this on. It's yeah. pretty exciting. It's really good for our employees. So. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing yeah, none, the motion carries. Okay, guys. Moving right along into our consent agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 18 and May 1st? Thank you, Chris. Second by Seth. All right. Any amendments to the minutes or any seeing none? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> any opposed? Yep. I didn't any hear a commendation for these wonderful um, minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> they were beautiful. <laughs> Can you please add gold star there? <laughs> I'll take right. care of it. Good job, guys. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Approve the board orders, please. The board orders are around. Got oh, you've got that. Okay. <clears throat> I move that we approve the board orders for April 18th, 2024 through May 15th, 2024, in the total amount of $959,254.58. Thank you, Ursula. Second? Sorry. Second by Seth. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Okay, we're moving to future agenda items. Uh, we still have an executive session, so I'm not going to ask uh, Megan to pull out our working calendar right now. I do want to remind people to sign. Some of you had sent me an, an email or a text saying that you are busy and can't participate in any of the. Uh, graduation ceremonies but i just want to make sure that everybody got the document and that you're able yeah. to sign up so we're hoping to have that by whatever date is that i put there seventh i think it was june seventh so if you guys could please fill out that yeah, that would be great and then a reminder that at least we have a meeting tomorrow too right for mm -hmm. the ones that signed up yeah. <laughs> okay and i'm counting on you and we're in person so, here and we're here. in person yeah. here Okay, uh -huh. so with that, I'm mm -hmm. looking for a motion to go into. Uh, we usually have public. Uh, it's open to public. To uh, we just forgot to put it in our agenda. But if there's any members of the public that wish to make a comment at the end of the meeting, now or wait until the next meeting. I don't see any hands, and we don't have any members of the public here. So I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session. Um, for the Second. purpose of student residency request <laughs> to include the purpose of student in the public, public comment. comment. 
Oh, um, you want to make a public comment? You're out of time. Um, I, I, I <laughs> wanted to um, see if we could change our um, public uh, comment procedure so that we have more of a public dialogue like we did during the May 1st um, engagement with the community because it was really productive. And I think when we have public comment and we're just being talked at without having a, a, an exchange, um, I think we lose something. And I think we can learn something and, and, and public mem members of public can learn from us. Um, at least to at least try it. I know it's maybe someone would think it may be unwieldy. Um, I don't think it would be because I think it would be somewhat limited, but to try a different format for public communication, public involvement in our, in our meetings. Um, to be able to respond. If someone has a question, just to respond. And what comes to mind is uh, when one of our uh, uh, audience members was talking about a $10 million budget surplus that we had, and you know our protocol... We don't have that. We don't, right, but we didn't say it to him. We didn't say, where did you get that number? And it kind of floated out there, and, and it was unfortunate, because it should be, and again, we should be able to say, what's your information? That's not correct. We're not laboring with that, rather than let her assume, and maybe other members of the public assume it's her. Um, so I think having a dialogue would be helpful in how we engage with public. So Chris, meetings. we can take this as a topic at a later yeah. time as a, as a board or a retreat. Mm -hmm. I do want to remind us that we do have a first meeting of the month where we can engage, which is what we did on May 1st. We used that first meeting <coughs> of the month to engage. So if we have other ways to engage with the community with a different dialogue, it, Today, just to put an example right now, like just imagine today with the amount of, if this is a meeting of the board where the board needs to do work in behalf of our communities. So I'm just saying that, but we can, because yeah. it's late and we have a motion on the table okay. already. Okay. We, but the other thing is, we could just follow up on the board's request for information so that when we get into the community engagement, we have more information on school performances and things like that in a form that is sensible. That I didn't hear that as a request for information. I heard that as a reaction to the data that we showed, a feedback from the board to saying, when we look at this data, it would be helpful to look at that. That's not something I would be able to reproduce in any short order of time. And I think it's something that will, that will be noted when we go back to the ed quality monitoring. I just don't want to oversell no, I, and I, have McKaylin think that I'm going to come back on June 11th with, the, with that information. Well, I mean, honestly, my hope was that in the time frame of the discussion and reconfiguration, we would have some picture of that. Yeah, when, when we are having through that, through those three phases, we, at some point we will look at that too. Yeah, it's why saying, it's a point of information that we can. Yeah, a point of order for the board is when information is requested as part of a process, it's either a request from an individual or it's a request of the board, especially if it's something that needs to be produced. Mm -hmm. And just like the need, the, and we heard the desire to have a full on budget, this is back to the committee meeting, but a full on budget for the simulations being created, great. That request comes in, we're able to say, here's about how long we think it would take to get that. And then it goes from there. So it's, and, and that's not uh, an, an obtuse or a desire to not provide it. It's just simply logistically, if it's something that doesn't exist in short order, mm -hmm. I can't guarantee that we would have it exactly in that manner for purposes of configuration. I don't know that we could deliver on that request. We can contemplate it and, and report back, but I just want to, I don't want to oversell expectations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kara, I see you. Uh, did, did you have a comment just before we go into executive session? Just because I, I see now your video and I see you live. No, I always just turn my video on to wave goodnight. Oh, <laughs> oh, well, we're going to miss you. Thank you for being here. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, so we have a motion on there to go into executive to session. Yes. So, to include, that's what Keely was getting <laughs> into. Doing a terrible job of this. To, no, to you're include not. Megan Roy. <laughs> yeah. Is that it? Yep, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Okay. okay. And a second by Ursula. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, in you. Did you just second that I could second it? Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Coming up, I'll check this question. Okay, I have a motion, please? I move that we accept the request. 
Residency. We already came out. Yes, the residency request. Didn't you notice we're in a different room? Oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so moved by Ursula, second by Amelia. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Contentions, hearing none. The motion carries. Move to adjourn. And we have a consensus. Let's go. Thanks, everyone. That was a move.